This is one of the most frequently regurgitated narratives about basketball in the 1960s. And now that I've heard the most famous analyst in all of basketball make this claim as well, I knew I had to make this video. To understand what I'm talking about, go ahead and take a listen. First off, we gotta hear Shaq now do this. Shaq what? is, what, the fifth best center in the history of the NBA? What? Fifth. What? what? Shaq. What do you mean, what? Well, who, who's the four what? ahead of Shaquille O'Neal? Have you, like you lost name? your you, you damn mind? You want me to name him for you? What? Just sure, him? go ahead. Kareem. Go ahead. Kareem. Okay. Yeah. Will. No. Uh, oh, I'm not giving my. it to no, Will. No, you guys are crazy. No. I'm not giving it to Will. No. You're not I'm not. Put Will Chamberlain, who averaged 50 points a game and scored Wait, who a hundred a foot game taller, in 30 Who's a foot nuts. taller no. than 99% of the league? Who's a foot taller than 99% of the league? What? Bro, what are you talking about, man? Oh, yeah, no, now this clip went viral for a variety of reasons. And just so you know, I will be tackling Mad Dog's take on Shaquille O'Neal. But this video isn't about him. This is about Wilt Chamberlain. Stephen A. Smith responded to Mad Dog's Wilt Chamberlain ranking with my biggest pet peeve in all of basketball, as he stated that Wilt was, quote, a foot taller than 99% of the league. Let me be clear, this is objectively false, and the data can easily be found online. So honestly, it's kind of crazy for someone as old as Stephen A, who claims to love basketball as much as he does, to say something so blatantly ignorant about Wilt Chamberlain. In the 1961-62 NBA season, Wilt Chamberlain famously averaged 50 points and 26 rebounds per game. That feat sounds so insane and outlandish compared to anything else we've ever known, so people have tried to make sense of it for years, so they can at least comprehend it. But unfortunately, that's often resulted in people telling lies, and those lies get perpetuated, and eventually it's become the popular belief. The average height of the NBA player in 1962 was 6 foot 5 inches tall. And last year, in the modern NBA, the average height was 6 foot 6 inches tall. The difference was literally just 1 inch. In 62, Wilt played against Walter Dukes of the Detroit Pistons at the center position, who was 7 feet tall and was a two-time NBA All-Star. And they played against each other 10 times that regular season. Swady Halbrook of the Syracuse Nationals was 7 foot 3 inches tall which was literally two inches taller than Wilt, and Chamberlain played against him ten times that year. Bill Russell was six foot ten inches tall, and was arguably the greatest defensive player in NBA history, and Wilt also played against him ten times that year. Walt Bellamy of the Chicago Packers was six foot eleven inches tall, and that year he averaged 32 points and 19 rebounds, and again, Wilt had to play against him 10 times that regular season. Ray Felix of the Los Angeles Lakers was another former NBA All-Star, and he was 6 foot 11 inches tall, and Wilt played against him 10 times. The New York Knicks had a twin tower tandem of Daryl Emhoff and Phil Jordan, who were each 6 foot 10 inches tall, and Wilt Chamberlain had to play against them 12 times that season. And in those contests, he averaged a whopping 54.5 points per game. I just accounted for 62 of the 80 games that Wilt played that season. The only team in the league who didn't have a player over 6'9 was the St. Louis Hawks, who had three rotating 6'9 players to defend Wilt, which were Clyde Lavellet, Larry Faust, and Bob Pettit. To a certain extent, Wilt did take advantage of those smaller matchups, as he averaged 54.2 points in those nine contests. But here's the thing, he still averaged 49.9 points per game in those 71 games against everyone else. It's also funny to me how people act like this is such an unheard of thing in the modern NBA. For goodness sake, Bam Adebayo starts at center for the Miami Heat, and he's just 6'9". Kevon Looney starts as center for the Golden State Warriors, and he's six foot nine as well. In the case of Bam, he's one of the best defensive players in the entire league at the position, as he's earned four all-defense team selections, regardless of the fact that he's one of the much shorter centers. 
According to Basketball Reference, there are 17 active players in the NBA today who are 6'9 or shorter and who play primarily at the center position. As you can see, size isn't everything when it comes to quality basketball. So to then obsessively focus on it as a way to criticize Will Chamberlain is simply a casual way of thinking. If you asked Wilt, I'm sure that he would rather play against seven footers like Walter Dukes and Halbrook rather than play against the much shorter Bill Russell. Now before some of you get triggered in the comments, you need to understand the purpose of this video. If you want to talk about how offense and rebounding were inflated in Wilt's era, then we can have that conversation and I'm willing to listen. If you want to talk about the general difference in athleticism between the modern players and the players of the 60s, then I'm willing to have that conversation. If you want to talk about how the game is more global now, which enriches the talent pool of the NBA, then I'm willing to have that talk. But what I'm not willing to accept is people claiming that Wilt took advantage of defenders a foot shorter than him, because that is simply a lie, and it reveals that the person making the argument is either doing it in bad faith, or they're just extremely ignorant about basketball history. Again, it's a short and sweet video, but it has to be said, as too many young fans still believe that Wilt took advantage of 6 foot 4 centers, which simply isn't the case. So go ahead and share this video, so hopefully the basketball community can start to have more genuine discussions about the 1960s. So every once in a while, there's this weird thing that happens in basketball media, where everyone seems to be dogpiling on one specific player, or on one specific legend simultaneously. We've been witnessing that fairly recently, and in this case, Shaquille O'Neal is the target. So there's three instances that I want to talk about. The first is the debate on first take between Stephen A. and Mad Dog. The second is what Bill Simmons said recently on his podcast, where he compared the modern Joel Embiid to Shaquille O'Neal. And third is the thing Shaquille O'Neal has been saying about himself. Yes, believe it or not, I have Shaq as one of the people who needs to stop disrespecting the legacy of Shaquille O'Neal. First off, let's tackle the perspective of Mad Dog on first take. Take a listen to his thoughts on the diesel. First off, we got to hear Shaq now do this. Shaq what? is, what, the fifth best center in the history of the NBA? What? Fifth. Fifth. What? what? Shaq. What do you mean, what? Well, who, who's the four Wait, what? ahead of Shaquille O'Neal? Have like you lost your damn mind? You, you want me to name mind? him for you? What? You want me Just to name sure, him? go ahead. Kareem. Go ahead. Kareem. Okay. Yeah. Will. No. Uh, I'm oh not giving my, it to no, Will. No, you guys are crazy. No. I'm not giving it to Will. No. You're not going to put Will Chamberlain, who averaged 50 points a game and scored Wait, a foot game taller, no. Who was a you're foot not. taller no. than 99% of the league? Oh, yeah. The most not. dominant player in NBA history. Who was stopping Shaquille O'Neal in who, any era? And who's uh, – Tim oh, Duncan is better in, than he is. In, Tim Duncan's better. And well, I'll tell you something. Two other guys. That's not a center. Tim Duncan's Well, Elijah Wan is better. We'll beat him four Two straight Two-time champion of Shaq's four. Shaq's no scoring four. titles to Shaq's two. What are you talking about? And I tell you, somebody else who's better. You can laugh where you want. I love Akeem, but he wants Shaq. Oh, he's a better player than Shaq. Oh, God, he's better. Uh, can, uh, well, oh, he killed. Be First off, he played Shaq wait, and beat him four straight games. They find me better player. Me. He's not better than Moses Malone. What? There's no chance. Don't give me that Oh, what? my Lord, why are you no allowed way. to talk basketball? Why he, are you, I love Moses Malone. Elite you think, you think Shaq? You think Shaq? Big, big, Malone, Moses Malone, Malone was not Shaq. Help. Not a chance. And he was great, Jeez. but he wasn't Shaq. Help, Lord. Malone led the Jeez. league in rebounding Help. six oh. so consecutive what? years. So what? He won two MVPs. So, he ever, oh, so now that you've seen this recent episode of grown adults screaming at each other, what are some takeaways? Well, for one, Mad Dog said that Shaq was the fifth greatest center ever, but then he went on to name five players ahead of him, which were Kareem, Wilt Chamberlain, Tim Duncan, Hakeem Olajuwon, and Moses Malone. Naturally, this would place Shaq as the sixth greatest center ever, even though he said fifth. Whether or not you consider Tim Duncan primarily as a power forward or a center is certainly debatable, so I won't fault people either way on that one. Hakeem Olajuwon is an interesting one to have ahead of Shaq, and honestly, I go back and forth on this ranking. Mad Dog states that Hakeem swept Shaq in four straight games, 
And he's correct on that, as The Rock has won the 1995 championship over Shaq's Orlando Magic. But using that as a way of saying Hakeem is better is way too simplistic. For one, although Shaq was incredible, he wasn't yet in his peak form, which he later experienced in Los Angeles. That matchup was between an experienced 32-year-old Hakeem Olajuwon versus a young and developing 23-year-old Shaq. So that's not the most fair comparison when you're looking at their careers as a whole. The other thing that's worth mentioning is that saying that the rocket swept the magic is the far more accurate way of stating it, rather than saying that Hakeem swept Shaq. Because if you watched that series, and if you look at their production, you'll see that it was a pretty even battle with a slight edge to Hakeem. Over that series, the Dream averaged about 33, 11, and 5 on 48% shooting from the field, while Shaq put up 28, 12, and 6 on 59%. Beyond that series, Stephen A mentions that Shaq has four rings to Hakeem's two. Which is true, but Hakeem didn't have the luxury of playing alongside of a lethal Kobe Bryant and Dwayne Wade during his prime years. So again, maybe not the most fair comparison. Shaq did have two scoring titles, but Hakeem has two Defensive Player of the Year awards, which is something that Shaq never achieved. Personally, I think Akeem is the greatest defensive player since Bill Russell, and it's a large gap between second and third. Honestly, I have no problem with either Shaq or Elijahwan being ranked higher, and I can make an argument either way. But then he took it to another level entirely when he said Moses Malone. Listen, I'm a little frustrated he said this because I personally believe that Moses is usually one of the top three most underrated players of all time. But naturally, by pitting him against Shaquille O'Neal, he's inviting people to criticize him instead of appreciate him. Moses was simply one of the greatest rebounders of all time. And as Mad Dog said, he led the NBA in rebounding six times in his career, which is a feat that Shaq could only dream of, as he never led the NBA in rebounding. With that being said, Shaq is without question a better rim protector than Moses, and he's a vastly better scorer as well. In Moses Malone's lengthy career, he only had two seasons where he averaged at least 26 points per game. On the other hand, Shaq did that every season for 10 years straight. Add on the fact that Shaq has four championships to Moses' one, and 14 All-NBA teams to Moses' eight, and yeah, Shaq is without question higher on the all-time list. People forget that for three or four straight years of basketball, every team outside of Los Angeles was trying to stop Shaq, and would spend entire off-seasons making moves to adjust to him. He was the league's gravitational pull during his best in the NBA, and nowadays people are taking that for granted. Now that ESPN clip wasn't the most disrespectful thing to Shaq in this video, it's this next one. Take a listen to these recent comments from Bill Simmons on his podcast. This Embiid season though, just quickly, holy sh**. So he's averaging 35 points a game. I think he's the best offensive center since Kareem in 1972. Kareem in 72, 34.8 points a game, 57% field goal. Embiid is 35 points a game, 55% field goal. Here's the thing. Termini mentioned this last week on the podcast, and this is the most important in B point. And this is why he has a case for being the best offensive scoring center that we've seen since Will Chamberlain. He makes his free throws. He's at 89.3% for his free throws this year. He's making 10.3 free throws a game out of 11.6 attempts. Shaq in 2000, Shaq averaged 29.7 points a game in his MVP season in 2000. Embiid was 35 points a game. Shaq was 57% from, from field goals and beats 55. Hmm, what's the difference? Shaq made 5.5 .5 out of 10.4 free throws a game. And Bede makes almost five more free throws a game, which is exactly the difference in their points per game. And on top of it, you can't foul him at the end of games. So I have Shaq, I don't know, he's like 12th or 13th in my Pantheon. At least this version of Embiid right now is just a better player than Shaq. He is because Shaq was a 44 minute overpowering guy and in the playoffs against the wrong team, whatever. But those last four minutes, that's when Kobe was so important and you know all that stuff. But 
uh, Shaq's free throw shooting was an absolute unequivocal liability for them. And Embiid's free throw shooting is a, a legitimate strength for the Sixers. So, Jesus, 35 points a game and shooting almost 90% from three and you're seven foot two. Unbelievable. All right. Now, before I pick this apart, I want you to understand I'm actually a big fan of Bill Simmons. In many ways, I admire this guy considering how he's simply a basketball super fan who built his brand on the power of his passion. In many ways, I'm trying to follow the path that he set out. This is also my copy of The Book of Basketball, which is a book he wrote and is an awesome read. So with all of these things considered, I'm actually surprised to hear him make such a casual conclusion in this instance. Looking at different eras and seeing a recent guy averaging 35 and one guy averaging 30 and then concluding that the more recent guy is better simply because 35 is higher than 30 is one of the most surface level takes that I've heard. Since the NBA merger in 1976, this is the highest scoring NBA season ever. In today's NBA, teams are averaging 115.5 points per game. And at Shaq's 99-2000 MVP season, teams were averaging only 97.5 points per game. And in all of Shaq's seasons with the Lakers, that was the only year where the league average was above 97 points. For a multitude of reasons, offensive statistics are ridiculously inflated in the modern game. There's triple doubles galore, there's back-to-back 20-point -back and 20-assist nights, 40 and 50-point games are a nightly occurrence, and a rookie flirted with a quadruple double while having a minutes restriction. In the modern season, 14 players are averaging at least 26 points per game, and in Shaq's MVP season, he was one of only two players to average at least 26. I'm writing this script on January 1st, 2024, and as of this moment, there have been 462 30-point games in the 2023-2024 season. In the totality of the 1999-2000 season, there was a total of 502 30-point games. So obviously, the total is close. But it shouldn't be. Considering the fact that modern teams are only 32 games into the 82-game regular season, this means that this current year will far exceed the amount of 30-point performances of the entire 99-2000 season, well before we've even hit the halfway point. If that doesn't tell you how inflated today's stats are, then nothing will. The numbers being inflated is just one of three reasons why these comments are ridiculous by Bill Simmons. The second reason is because it's insanely premature. We are just over one third into an NBA regular season and we're giving someone the title of the greatest scoring center since Kareem, simply because of what he's done in a very small sample size. 32 games into the 2019-2020 NBA season, James Harden was averaging a whopping 38.3 points per game. People were speculating if he would average 40 that year, and at that point, some were even referring to him as the greatest scorer since Michael Jordan. But then, he dropped off significantly, and averaged just 30.8 points for the rest of the year, dropping his seasonal average to 34.3. Now in hindsight, those comments about Harden look ridiculous, and people can now see how these analysts were slaves of the moment. Listen, I don't care if it's 1964, 1994, or 2024. Averaging 35 points per game on tremendous efficiency is incredibly impressive and worth appreciating. And from that perspective, Joel Embiid certainly deserves his due credit. But if you're going to give him the title of the greatest offensive center since Kareem, then you can't just ignore the context of the era, like the faster pace of play, like the existence of the defensive three-second rule which opens up the painted area, and the less frequent calls for traveling. The third reason why Bill's comments are absurd is because, good God, the playoffs actually matter. How are you going to give someone the title of the greatest offensive player when that same player isn't even great when the games actually matter? In the entire 2023 playoffs, Embiid averaged just 23.7 points on 43.1% shooting and 17.9% from three-point range. 
in the entire 2022 playoffs, Embiid averaged 23.6 points on 48.4% shooting and 21.2% from three-point range. He's in his late 20s, and these are the prime years of his career, yet he has a tendency of coming up incredibly small offensively in the playoffs. Meanwhile, these were the averages that Shaq was putting up for three years in the NBA Finals at this same age, and at a time that producing offense was much more difficult. Plain and simple, this shouldn't even be a conversation. What Embiid is doing roughly a third into the regular season is impressive. But he hasn't yet earned his way into the conversation with Shaq of the greatest scoring center since Kareem. So at this point of the video, we've seen ESPN analysts disrespect Shaq, we've seen a podcaster disrespect Shaq, and now we're going to take a look at Shaq disrespecting Shaq. When it comes to personalities, the Diesel is one of the most fascinating ones that I've ever followed. He almost seems bipolar at points. Sometimes, he's the most egotistical person in the room. As he'll flaunt his four rings, he'll declare himself as the most dominant player ever, and he'll speak of himself in third person. But then at other times, you won't find a more humble athlete. Shaq recently said that Steph Curry is better than him. Years ago, he said that Giannis was better than him at the same age. He said that Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, and Hakeem Olajuwon were all better. Recently, he said that at no point was he ever better than Kobe Bryant and Dwayne Wade, which is crazy when you consider how he was once teammates with a fresh out of high school Kobe Bryant who was averaging just 7 points, while Shaq was averaging 26 and 12. In 2001, he said that Kobe was the best player in the world, despite the fact that Shaq was the defending MVP and finals MVP. In 1997, he tried to decline his spot among the 50 greatest players of all time, so a more veteran player could take his spot. I'm a big believer in letting others praise you and not doing it yourself. But at the same time, Shaq's humility and dismissiveness of himself has gone so far that I think it's starting to affect how he's remembered. This was a guy who was one vote away from a unanimous MVP. This is a guy who averaged 35 and 15 over three straight NBA Finals, which is a championship accomplishment that can only be rivaled by the great Michael Jordan. Shaq was a guy who shaped the Western Conference in the early 2000s. And sure, he wasn't a great foul shooter, but I've never seen a player put more bodies in foul trouble than Shaq did at his peak. Shannon Sharp and many other talking heads have regurgitated the narrative that Shaq didn't have great longevity due to his lack of fitness. And although that's true to a small extent, it's definitely massively overblown. For goodness sake, Shaq finished as a top 4 finalist in the MVP voting a whopping 12 seasons apart, which very few legends can even claim. If it wasn't for Wilt Chamberlain, he would be universally recognized as the most dominant player in NBA history. And without question, he's one of the top three greatest finals performers of all time. Which is, after all, where legacies are built. So at this point, I don't care if Shaq keeps disrespecting himself. If you want to authentically claim that you know basketball, then you'll stop disrespecting Shaquille O'Neal. All the time, I see people engaging in the debate of who truly dominated Father Time, Michael Jordan or LeBron James. It's certainly not the worst argument to have, as both superstars were extremely impressive basketball players in their latter years. At 38 years old, LeBron took his Lakers all the way to the Western Conference Finals, while averaging these ridiculous numbers throughout the regular season. On the other hand, there's Michael Jordan, who joined one of the worst teams in the league at the age of 38, and up until he tore a ligament in his knee, he had them destined for the NBA playoffs. But what if I told you that neither of these legends were actually the GOAT candidate who had the most impressive accomplishment at that age? Today, our story takes us back to the mid-80s and the heat of the greatest rivalry in basketball history. At the end of the 1984 NBA season, the Lakers and Celtics had met up in the NBA Finals for the first time since the 1960s. It was an absolute classic, as the series was decided over seven hard-fought games. At the end of the day, it was Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics who were taking home the Larry O'Brien Trophy. 
This started a new narrative amongst the media, that the Lakers were too old and the time of the Celtics had now arrived. In truth, the Lakers team as a whole wasn't tremendously old, but their captain, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, was now in his late 30s and in the twilight of his career. Regardless of whatever narratives the media could come up with, the fact remained, the Lakers and Celtics were easily the two best teams in the entire league. And after both teams won over 60 games throughout the regular season, they seemed on a collision course for a rematch in the 1985 NBA Finals. Magic Johnson was leading the Lakers, as he was now clearly coronated as the Lakers' best player within the franchise. On the other hand, Larry Bird had just won his second straight league MVP, and was making a strong claim for the title of the best player in the NBA. At the time, the belief among general basketball audiences is that one of these two players would have been the deciding factor in the upcoming NBA Finals. The Celtics were the defending champions, and they had home court advantage for the rematch. The majority of the confidence seemed to be in their corner, and that would definitely be the case after Game 1. When the series began, the Lakers didn't even seem to be in the same league as Boston, as the Celtics were absolutely on fire from the field, while the Lakers looked slow, sluggish, and afraid of the moment. At the end of the night, the Celtics had completely destroyed the Lakers, with a final score of 148 to 114. To this day, this game is known as the Memorial Day Massacre. Despite the beatdown, Magic Johnson and James Worthy actually had decent outings for Los Angeles. But the player who didn't perform very well was their veteran center, Kareem Abdul Jabbar. On the night, Kareem only had 12 points and 3 rebounds, while he was simultaneously destroyed by the Celtics bigs, Robert Parrish and Kevin McHale. After the loss, the Lakers head coach Pat Riley was irate. Initially, he scolded the entire team, and then he pulled Kareem aside to scold him individually. The team proceeded to watch 4 hours of film, which was mostly centered around plays where Kareem had failed his assignments. Additionally, the media's response to this devastating loss was especially brutal on Kareem, as he was now 38 years old and in his 16th season in the NBA. Many were saying that Kareem was a liability for Los Angeles, and due to his tremendous mileage, critics were claiming that it was his time to retire in the offseason. Looking for comfort and inspiration, Kareem asked his father to accompany him on his way to attending Game 2. Kareem's dad actually rode the team bus to the stadium with the Lakers, which is usually something that was against the team's rules. But Pat Riley understood the uniqueness of the situation, and sympathized with Kareem's need to be with his dad during that time. It served as an inspiration for both the players and Riley, who delivered an epic speech on the bus ride to the game. There was immense pressure on the entire team, but no player was facing more pressure than Kareem, whose entire position was under question from the media and from general basketball audiences. There are many examples of NBA legends facing intense criticism and needing to prove themselves to restore their reputation. This was one of the greatest examples of that in the history of the NBA. For Game 2 in Boston, Los Angeles was ready, but no player was more locked in than the heavily scrutinized Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. At the age of 38, with nearly 55,000 career minutes on his legs, Kareem mustered up one of the all-time great performances in finals history. Offensively, defensively, and on the boards, he excelled well beyond the efforts of the Celtics bigs, as Kareem poured in 30 points, 17 rebounds, 8 assists, and 3 blocks on 58% shooting. It was a game the Lakers needed, not just to tie the series, but also for their confidence. And thanks to Kareem, they got the victory in Game 2, 109-102. In Game 3, Kareem continued his redemptive dominance, as he dropped 26 points, 14 rebounds, and 7 assists on 77% shooting. And the Lakers won that game as well, 136-111. Heading into Game 5, the series was tied at two games apiece, and with Game 6 and 7 scheduled to take place in Boston, the Lakers recognized Game 5 as a must-win situation. Despite everything he had provided up to that moment, the Lakers had to lean on their aging captain yet again, and once again, he rose to the occasion. 
as Kareem put up 36 points, 7 rebounds, 7 assists, and 3 blocks, leading the Lakers to a 120-111 victory. If there was any doubt on who was going to win this series, Kareem authoritatively put that to rest. And after yet another strong performance in Game 6, the Lakers had won the championship in the Garden, with a final score of 111-100. to On the series as a whole, Kareem averaged 25.7 points, 9 rebounds, 5.2 assists, and 1.5 blocks, on a lethal 60.4% shooting. At the age of 38 years and 54 days, he became the oldest Finals MVP in the history of the game. It's still the NBA record to this very day, and second place isn't remotely close, which was LeBron James in 2020, who won the award at 35 years and 284 days. In all 76 years of the NBA's existence, no other great has ever done anything like this. Players have played relatively well around the age of 40, but no one else at that age has appeared to be the best player on a court full of Hall of Famers on the game's biggest stage. It is worth mentioning that one of the reasons that people take this performance for granted is because Kareem played effective basketball for another four seasons after this, winning an additional two championships. He finally retired way after the critics initially told him to at the age of 42. So listen in, Jordan stands and LeBron stands. Maybe it's best if you both just stop fighting and instead recognize who's the real father of Father Time, the legendary Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Throughout the decades, there have been several great two-way players who left their lasting imprint on the league. Guys like Akeem Olajuwon, Scottie Pippen, Gary Payton, and even more recent stars like Kawhi Leonard and Paul George. But one of the all-time great two-way players who seems to fly under the radar everywhere other than on my channel is the Milwaukee Bucks legend Sidney Moncrief. This 6'4 point guard slash shooting guard was an absolute problem in the 1980s. For some reason, he's rarely mentioned when discussing the all-time great two-way players. But back in his era, everyone knew that he was one of the most dreaded one-on-one -on -one matchups in the entire league and on both ends of the court. So in order for us to understand what kind of player he was, let's start, as we always do, by taking it back to the beginning of his career. Moncrief was drafted by the Milwaukee Bucks with a fifth overall pick in the 1979 draft out of the University of Arkansas. Obviously, Magic Johnson took all of the headlines as the first pick in that historic draft. But the next best player to come out of the class of 79 was in fact Moncrief. He had a somewhat slow start to his career, and in his rookie season, he averaged just 8 points in 20 minutes of action, on a Bucks team that was still finding its groove. He didn't truly arrive until his third season in the league, which was his first year as an NBA All-Star. As the team's leader in points, assists, and rebounds, he led his Bucks to a 55-27 record, good enough for the second seed in the Eastern Conference. As a solid pickpocket and a smothering on-ball defender, there's a good chance that he would have won the Defensive Player of the Year award that season if the award had actually existed at that point in history. But his time would soon come after. The Defensive Player of the Year award was introduced to the NBA in the 1982-83 season, and Moncrief went on to win the award in its first two seasons of existence in 1983 and 1984. To this very day, he's the only guard in NBA history to win the award multiple times. Not only was he a lockdown defender, but his skills continued to improve on the offensive end. As an athletically gifted slasher, he had his best season offensively in 1983, where he averaged over 22 points per game on 52.4% shooting. Typically, 6'4 guards struggle to be a high scorer while averaging north of 50% from the field. Not only did Moncrief do that in 1983, but he actually shot better than 50% from the field over the course of his career. From 1982 to 1986, he was an all-star in five straight seasons. But beyond the fact that his individual abilities were shining, he was also leading his team to be a consistent contender in the Eastern Conference. For some reason, when people talk about the 1980s Eastern Conference, people seem to only think of the Celtics, the Pistons, the Bulls, and the 76ers. But the thing is, the Bucks were always in that mix as well. 
From 1981 to 1987, Moncrief led his Bucks to have at least 50 wins in seven straight seasons, including trips to the Eastern Conference Finals in 1983, 1984, and 1986. One shocking accomplishment was when his Bucks swept Larry Bird and the Boston Celtics out of the 1983 semifinals, four games to zero. Larry Bird has since went on to describe that series as the most embarrassing moment of his life. In those semifinals, Moncrief led all players in scoring while leading his team in assists and steals. Eliminating Bird and the Celtics in the midst of their dynasty days was no easy task. But one of the greatest achievements of his career is what he accomplished in the 1985 NBA playoffs. When people think of Michael Jordan's playoff exits before Scottie Pippen developed into a co-star, they usually think of their losses at the hands of the Celtics and Pistons. But the thing is, neither of those teams were actually the first team to eliminate Michael Jordan from the playoffs. That was Sidney Moncrief and his Milwaukee Bucks. With the help of his co-star, Terry Cummings, the Bucks dominated the Bulls, winning the series in four games, three games to one. In that historic series, the two-time Defensive Player of the Year winner, Sidney Moncrief, contained Michael Jordan to only 43.6% shooting over the course of the series. And then, when it came to the offensive end, Sidney averaged 26.5 points, nearly 5 rebounds, and nearly 5 assists, on far greater than 50-40-90 percentages over the course of the series. At the end of the day, I can't say enough positive things about this incredibly overlooked guard. Being the only guard to win back-to-back -back DPOYs is a special achievement in and of itself. But doing it in an era where he had to consistently guard guys like Larry Bird, Michael Jordan, Dominique Wilkins, and Clyde Drexler is just overwhelmingly impressive. Although he was one of the best players in the league during his prime, and although he's one of the greatest two-way players of all time, unfortunately, he didn't have very great longevity due to his degenerative knee issues and significant heel issues that drastically limited his productivity as he entered his late 20s. The drop-off was dramatic, and by the age of 29, he was only a shell of what he once was. At the age of 31, he retired from the NBA and spent an entire year away from professional basketball. When he was 33 years old, he came back to the NBA as a member of the Atlanta Hawks, but he only had very minor contributions throughout the course of the regular season. He did manage to have one amazing flashback when he dropped 23 points in just 22 minutes in Game 4 of the first round against Detroit. The Hawks were eventually eliminated in five games, and Moncrief shelved his sneakers for good. In total, he made five All-Star teams, five All-NBA teams, five All-Defense teams, and was a two-time Defensive Player of the Year winner, and is a Basketball Hall of Famer. Some of the greatest players of all time remember the impact of Moncrief quite well. For example, Michael Jordan said this about the Bucks star. When you play against Moncrief, you're in for a night of all-around basketball. He'll hound you everywhere you go, both ends of the court. You just expect it. Larry Bird had this to say as well. Moncrief does everything you're supposed to do on defense and doesn't take any shortcuts. Plus, he does it every night. To me, what's mind-blowing is how he's rarely discussed among the greatest perimeter defenders in NBA history. Usually guys like Gary Payton, Michael Jordan, and even Kobe Bryant take all of the spotlight. But I think if you ask players who actually played against him in the 1980s, there's a very good chance that they have Moncrief in the top spot overall ahead of all those other legends. As for myself personally, well, it's tough to rank players defensively when there's so much nuance involved. At the very least, I have him as a top 5 perimeter defender on my all-time rankings. Since the initial creation of the National Basketball Association, there have been several different dynasties who have shaped the history and landscape of the sport. Of course, within those dynasties have been iconic superstar figures who get the vast majority of the attention. But with that being said, usually those players were such gigantic figures that they cast a massive shadow over the key contributors of their success. 
Today, we're looking at an unsung hero from each dynasty in chronological order, as we aim to appreciate these all-time great teams with a broader perspective. Before I get started, let me first explain the definition of a dynasty for this video. In this case, a dynasty is a team that won at least three championships in the span of a decade with the same core group of players. So without further ado, let's get into it. First off, Vern Mickelson of the 1950s Lakers. The superstar of that Lakers team was the 6'10 George Mikan, and honestly, I can even argue that he's underappreciated based on how much he dominated and based on how rarely his era is discussed. Regardless, most of you have heard of George Mikan, but I guarantee that only a few of you have ever heard of his sidekick, Vern Mickelson. Mickelson was a 6'7 power forward who had a lethal hook shot years before Kareem ever set foot in the NBA. He was one of those guys with that old school mindset that whenever possible, you show up to work. And as a result, in his 10 year career, he missed a grand total of just five regular season games. If the best ability is availability, then Mickelson was truly one of the very best. He was usually the team's second best scorer and rebounder behind Mikan. He won five NBA championships and was a six time all-star. At his peak in 1955, he was averaging over 18 points and 10 rebounds on 42% shooting, which was actually elite efficiency during the NBA's infancy. In a league that had many successful Robins, Mickelson was probably the first Robin in the history of NBA dynasties. Sam Jones of the 1960s Celtics Bill Russell was the legendary leader of the most dominant team in basketball history, which was the Celtics of the 60s. The thing is, Russell had the luxury of being able to focus almost exclusively on his defense and rebounding, while others carried the load of the team's offense. No one shouldered more of that offensive burden than his 6'4 shooting guard, Sam Jones. Sam had a game that was incredibly ahead of its time, as he had a good handle of the basketball and a smooth pull-up jumper. Not only was he often the leading scorer in the regular season, but he usually took his offensive game to another level in the playoffs. For example, in 1965, he averaged close to 30 points per game over the entirety of the postseason. He had four playoff games in his career where he dropped at least 40 points, including an efficient 51-point performance in 1967 against the New York Knicks, which was a series-clinching victory. Over his career, he was a five-time All-Star and won a ridiculous 10 championship rings in his 12 seasons in the NBA. Make no mistake, Bill Russell was the greatest player on that dynastic squad. But let's be honest, he often gets all of the credit when a significant portion of that belongs to his sharpshooting teammate. Michael Cooper of the 1980s Lakers Players like Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and James Worthy are the most famous faces of the Showtime Lakers, but they don't win five championships in that decade without their best defensive player, the 6'7 shooting guard, Michael Cooper. Cooper was one of the first 3 and D type of players, and he's one of the very best in both of those aspects. For a while, he was the NBA record holder for the most three-pointers made in a finals game. You'd be wrong if you assumed that he was just a shooter though, as he was freakishly athletic and was often the recipient of Magic Johnson's alley-oop passes. Defensively, he made a total of eight all-defense teams, which is the second most in franchise history behind only Kobe Bryant. And in 1987, he was named the NBA's Defensive Player of the Year, even though he was coming off the bench. Maybe the greatest piece of evidence of his all-time great defense is the fact that Larry Bird once referred to Cooper as the greatest defensive player that he's ever faced. He was a part of all five championship teams, and although he was never considered as a superstar, I certainly consider him as one of the greatest six men of all time. Dennis Johnson of the 1980s Celtics When it comes to these great Celtics teams, players like Larry Bird, Kevin McHale, and Robert Parrish seem to draw all of the attention, and even guys like Bill Walton and Danny Ainge get some of the shine as well. But the fantastic player that I almost never see mentioned in the documentaries or in the TV specials was the Celtics starting point guard slash shooting guard. Unlike Michael Cooper, DJ was not a great three-point shooter, 
but he was a massive help to the Celtics on both ends of the court. Prior to his days in Boston, DJ spent time as a leading star player and was even the finals MVP for the Seattle Supersonics in 1979. When he became a Celtic, less was required of him, but he still remained as a key scorer and distributor, as he averaged nearly 15 points and nearly 6 assists in his first three seasons in Boston. The best part of his game though was his elite on-ball defense, as he was regularly assigned to the best scoring wings in the entire league, like Michael Jordan for example. On the defensive end, there are very few who are more proven, as DJ made and earned a total of 9 all-defense team selections, which is tied for the second most selections for a guard in NBA history. Overall, he was a 3-time NBA champion and a 5-time All-Star. Ron Harper of the 1990s Bulls He was only there for the second three-peat, but his impact for that team should not be downplayed. Many people lose track of just how stacked those late 90s Bulls were. Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman created all of the headlines, and even Tony Kukoc earned the respect of the basketball world. But what's rarely mentioned is just how impactful Harper was, and how he was a legitimate star in his own right before joining Chicago. In his first eight years in the league, Harper was averaging around 20 points, 5 rebounds, 5 assists, and 2 steals, while being a pretty solid defensive player. Once in Chicago, he remained a full-time starter, but didn't have to score as much with teammates like Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen as his scoring dropped to roughly 8 points per game. On the other hand, Harper usually doesn't get enough credit for his contribution to their all-time great perimeter defense. He was fantastic at frustrating opposing guards and forcing them into making bad decisions. He was usually among the league leaders in steals per game, and when you mix that ability with Jordan, Pippen, and Rodman, well then it's no wonder why they were such a nightmare on defense. Derek Fisher of the 2000s Lakers Every single one of Kobe's five championship teams had Derek Fisher as a teammate. Oftentimes, Robert Ory is recognized as the clutch shooting role player during their championship runs, but I would argue that Fisher was just as valuable, if not more so. This 6'1 point guard was arguably the best spot up three point shooter on the entire team which was even more valuable for this specific group, considering how Shaq was often looking to kick the ball out to his shooters after the defense collapsed. In those situations, none were more dependable than Fisher, especially in the 2001 playoffs, where the Lakers famously steamrolled their way to the championship with a 15-1 record. Sure, Kobe and Shaq dominated, but over those playoffs, Fisher was the team's third leading scorer, averaging 13.4 points. And not only did he lead the team in three-point attempts, but he hit a ridiculous 51.5% of his three-point shots. In the years afterwards, Fisher continued to prove that he was one of the most clutch, role-playing shooters in the league, hitting numerous iconic shots in the postseason. Bruce Bowen of the 2000s Spurs. He's another incredibly valuable 3 and D player who was the Spurs starting small forward in 7 out of his 8 seasons in San Antonio. Bowen absolutely loved the corner 3, and under the coaching of Greg Popovich, he had plenty of opportunities. He was usually shooting around 40% from 3 point range, but at his peak in 2003, he shot a league best 44.1% over the course of the season. Even more valuable than his three-point shooting was his perimeter defense. Even though Tim Duncan is known as one of the greatest defensive players of all time, you can make the argument that he wasn't the best defender on his own team during his prime, as Bowen finished as the runner-up for the Defensive Player of the Year in three straight seasons, from 2005 to 2007. In total, he made eight all-defense teams, and I kinda think he isn't recognized for it because he often received the title of a dirty player from the basketball community, and I don't think anyone believes that more than Vince Carter, who was about ready to destroy Bowen after the third time he stepped under his foot and rolled Carter's ankle. Regardless on your opinions of Bowen's character, the reality is he was a pivotal aspect in three of their title runs in San Antonio. Andre Iguodala of the 2010s Warriors 
Back in the early years before Golden State, Iggy was seen as a star who could play above the rim and was averaging as high as 20 points per game in 2008. During his time in Golden State, he was in his early to mid 30s and he served the team as their sixth man. Over time, he started to own the role of a defensive specialist and did a fantastic job of containing the best wings in the league, like LeBron James, for example. Famously, he even won the 2015 Finals MVP thanks to his defensive effort on LeBron. Eventually, he was even in the group of Warriors designated as the death lineup, operating as a key facilitator and defender. In total, he made two all-defense teams and was a part of all four of the Warriors' championship runs. When the basketball community talks about the greatest defenders in NBA history, I hear a lot of different names come up. Of course, there's the more popular choices, like Dennis Rodman, Bill Russell, and Akeem Olajuwon. Then you'll hear some others, like Ben Wallace, Tim Duncan, Scottie Pippen, and so on. We could probably list off 50 commonly mentioned names before we finally got to the guy who was literally known as the Secretary of Defense. I'm talking about the Hall of Famer, Bobby Jones. Although most people don't ever mention him, I can make a strong argument that he's a top 10 defender of all time. He was a 6'9 power forward who played two seasons in the ABA before moving to the NBA during the merger. His professional career was between 1974 and 1986, and during that time, he had an impact that his teammates will always remember. Most famously was his impact with the Philadelphia 76ers. On that talented squad, he was usually coming off the bench, and actually won the Sixth Man of the Year award in 1983. In my opinion, he was like a gazelle, as his large strides made him a nightmare in transition, whether on offense or defense. Before LeBron made it cool for younger fans, Jones was a chase down blocking machine, constantly disrupting seemingly easy layups and dunks. In total, he made 11 all defense teams between the two leagues, which is tied for the fourth most in basketball history, trailing only Tim Duncan, Kobe Bryant, and Kevin Garnett. He was often near the league leaders in both steals and blocks, while being one of the most efficient shooters the game had to offer thanks to his quality shot selection. This double-double threat was a five-time All-Star, but his greatest achievement was his tremendous impact towards the 76ers championship team in 1983, as he helped them steamroll through the playoffs while losing only one playoff game in the process. Ultimately, if you're going to have a thorough conversation about the greatest defenders of all time, then you just can't do it without mentioning the one known as the Secretary of Defense. Many viewers are extremely knowledgeable when it comes to the deep and rich history of the NBA, so you'll be able to relate to me on this. When you have a knowledgeable understanding of past generations of basketball, you tend to get frustrated when the mainstream media completely disregards certain players who deserve to be in the conversation. Day after day, it's all about Jordan versus LeBron, and everyone else seems to be worthless in the conversation in the eyes of the media. Obviously, that's because there's an agenda behind it. The mainstream sports outlets want as many clicks as possible, so they will always steer the conversation in particular directions. If the GO conversation was all about Kareem versus Jordan, well then that wouldn't get as many clicks, because it doesn't involve an active player, which means it isn't as relevant to the modern audience. Trust me, I've seen this cycle play out a few times over the decades. Just wait until LeBron retires, and it will no longer be all about Jordan versus LeBron, because you'll then be talking about two retired players. Once LeBron is retired, they'll find a new active player to compare to a former great, whether that's LeBron or Jordan. So with this in mind, I began to wonder, who are some of the players who have been pushed aside in the conversations about who's the greatest? I decided to break this down by positions, and let me know in the comments if you agree or disagree with my selections. 
Starting off the list, we're looking at the center position, which is the most competitive group of legends in NBA history. But for me personally, the guy who absolutely deserves to be in the conversation of the greatest centers of all time is the man known as the chairman of the boards, Moses Malone. This 6'10 center dominated the league right before Magic and Bird took over the NBA and stole all of the attention, which kind of explains why he's so underrecognized. In his career, Malone was a 13-time All-Star, a 6-time rebounding champion, a 3-time league MVP, an NBA champion, and the 1983 Finals MVP. Without question, he was one of the greatest rebounders of all time. But more specifically, since the offensive rebounding stats have been tracked, he's the greatest offensive rebounder in NBA history. And it's not even remotely close. Between NBA and ABA stats, these are the four totals of the other top five offensive rebounders of all time. And then, way ahead of them, in a stratosphere completely on his own, is Moses Malone who was over 2,500 offensive rebounds ahead of the nearest competitor. At his peak, he was averaging over 30 points per game and around 15 rebounds, while making first-team all-defense on two separate occasions. I believe the reason why Moses isn't remembered more fondly by specific organizations is because he's probably the greatest journeyman in the history of the NBA, as he changed teams a total of 10 times in his 21-year career. Regardless, when you look at his career and production as a whole, there's no reason why Malone shouldn't be considered as a top-tier center among the all-time greats. Next, I'm looking at the power forward position, and the player who should be in the discussion, but almost never is, is the Boston Celtics legend Kevin McHale. McHale was so dangerous and efficient in the post that he was nicknamed the Torture Chamber because of how he dominated helpless defenders. It makes sense why they had no answer for him as he was 6 foot 10 inches tall with an 8 foot long wingspan. On top of that ridiculous reach, McHale also had an extremely high release point on his jump shot. Along with that, McHale had some of the best footwork of any big man that I've ever seen, second only to Akeem Olajuwon. In the history of the NBA, only two players have shot at least 60% from the field and 80% from the free throw line while averaging at least 20 points per game. Those players are Nikola Jokic and Kevin McHale, and McHale had the highest scoring average of any player who's reached those percentages, which was when he scored 26.1 points per game in 1987. His ridiculous size and wingspan also made him a terrifying interior defender, as he deserves a tremendous amount of credit for the Celtics' consistently elite defense throughout the 1980s. Obviously, Larry Bird deserves the majority of the credit for his success. He doesn't win nearly as much in that decade if it wasn't for his all-time great sidekick. In total, McHale was a three-time champion, he made seven all-star teams, and made six all-defense teams. Honestly, I remember in the early 2000s, McHale was usually debated among the greatest power forwards of all time, alongside of Karl Malone and Charles Barkley. But ever since the emergence of Dirk Nowitzki, Kevin Garnett, and Tim Duncan, McHale has seemed to have become an afterthought in the discussion. But without question, he deserves a spot in that conversation. Next up, let's take a look at the small forward position. As far as I can tell, the small forward debate is always between two greats, LeBron James and Larry Bird. But there's another player who could definitely have an argument, but most people do not include him because of a technicality. He's known as the Dr. Julia Serving. This 6'7 small forward was known to many as the Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan, as he dominated the game with his graceful skills and with his incredible athletic ability. The thing is, Dr. J was playing professional basketball during the NBA merger in 1976, which means that he spent some years in the ABA and many years in the NBA. Usually, his NBA accomplishments are the only things that are considered in these debates. But that's not fair to Dr. J at all, as some of his best seasons came in his ABA days. When you include his ABA stats and accomplishments, and factor in his entire professional career as a whole, Irving has over 30,000 points, which means that he and LeBron James are the only small forwards to eclipse the 30k mark. 
He has three championship rings, 16 all-star appearances, four league MVPs, three scoring titles, and an all-defense team appearance. That's certainly a worthy resume of consideration, but simply because it's split between two leagues, it usually is not. Shooting guard is a position that I'm definitely skipping, because with Michael Jordan and Kobe Bryant at the top of the totem pole, and with Dwayne Wade usually getting a respectable amount of recognition, there's really no one else who could possibly have an argument amongst that group. Now onto the point guard position. I usually hear people debate Steph Curry and Magic Johnson, and then after that, I hear people mention names like Oscar Robertson, John Stockton, and even Chris Paul. Yet for some reason, Isaiah Thomas of the Detroit Pistons seems to have been lost in the discussion. One of the weirdest developments in my life is that I've suddenly become one of the channels who has to remind people about the legacy of Isaiah Thomas. I hated this guy when I was young because he was the leader and the floor general of the bad boy Detroit Pistons. Although they were consistent contenders in the Eastern Conference, they were also one of the most hated and least respected teams of all time, as their brutal and sometimes dirty physical style of play created a lot of adversaries in the basketball world. With that being said, don't let that fool you into thinking that they were not an extremely talented team. And specifically, in the case of Isaiah Thomas, he was one of the greatest dual threats in NBA history. In the 1984-85 season, Isaiah averaged a whopping 13.9 assists per game, which, outside of John Stockton, is the highest assists per game average in NBA history. But he was also capable of completely taking over a game offensively. Like when he clutchly scored 16 points in just 94 seconds in an elimination playoff game. Or like when he scored 25 points in just one quarter of an NBA Finals game, which he did on a swollen ankle. To this day, that is the highest scoring quarter in NBA Finals history. Isaiah was the type of guy who could get 20 assists in one game and then score 40 points in the very next game, if that is what his team needed. This dual threat aspect was always a strong part of his skill set, and there's very few all-time great point guards who can make that same claim. He was also one of the greatest ball handlers in the game, as he was basically the Kyrie Irving of his era when it came to elite handling. He was a 12-time All-Star, a 2-time NBA Champion, the 1985 Assist Champion, and the 1990 Finals MVP. Ask anyone who watched NBA basketball during the 1980s, and they'll tell you that although Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, and Michael Jordan drew all of the attention and adoration, on any given night, Isaiah Thomas could have been the best player on the court, and no one would be surprised. One of the most discussed topics on this channel is the underrated and underappreciated players of the NBA's past. When I'm asked who I think the most underrated players are, it's very difficult to answer because the truth is there's just so many of them. These are players who for one reason or another have been forgotten or overlooked as the years have gone on. Simply off the top of my head, I wrote down 35 players who had a chance at making this list, and then I narrowed those 35 down to only 10. Now one crucial detail to note for my list, there are no active players on my list, and I believe there's a good reason for that. I've said this before in a previous video, but when we're talking about the most underrated players, there's usually one major factor that plays a part, ignorance. And I don't mean that to sound negative, but I mean that in the word's actual definition. It's easy for a player to be underappreciated when young fans literally know nothing about the player being discussed. Which is also why it's difficult for a modern player to be underrated to the same extent, because although that active player has his fans and his haters, by and large, everyone is familiar with his skill set and talent. That's why there's such an old school flavor to this list, and if I'm still doing this YouTube thing 20 years from now, I'll be using the same explanation to tell you why there's more players from the 2020s than there are from the 2040s. So without further ado, let's get into it. I'll keep saying it because I feel pretty confident about it, but Moses Malone is the most underrated center of all time. I believe a major part of why he's so underrated is the fact that he's arguably the greatest journeyman to ever play, as Moses played for 8 different franchises throughout his basketball career. 
I mean, for goodness sake, look at how many different jerseys this guy wore over the course of his career. Due to this, no one specific franchise can claim him as their own, which certainly affects how he's remembered. Moses was simply dominant though, especially in terms of his scoring and rebounding. He was a 13-time All-Star, a 3-time League MVP, won 6 rebounding titles, and was the best player on the 1983 Philadelphia 76ers, a team that won the NBA championship and has a legitimate case for the title of the greatest team in NBA history. Moses' nickname was the chairman of the boards, and there are few players who have dominated a single aspect of pro basketball as much as Malone dominated the offensive boards. During the 1981-82 season, Moses averaged 6.9 offensive rebounds per game. No one else in the history of the NBA has ever officially averaged as many offensive rebounds as Moses did that season. That's a ton of second chance opportunities to consistently provide for your team. If you're still not thoroughly impressed, consider this. There are 8 players in NBA history with over 4,000 offensive rebounds. Robert Parrish is second all time with 4,598. Moses has 6,731. And that doesn't even include his two seasons in the ABA. Honestly, it's laughable how much he dominates everyone else in that area. Next up is Bob McAdoo. When we talk about the NBA's 50 Greatest Players ceremony in 1997, people usually point to Dominique Wilkins as the biggest snub from that list. But I could give a strong argument that it was actually Bob McAdoo. During Kareem Abdul-Jabbar's individual dominance in the 1970s, McAdoo was one of the only players who legitimately challenged him as a regular MVP candidate, and he actually won the award over Kareem in 1975. McAdoo was a 6'9 center, but he played the game like a smooth small forward, as he scored the vast majority of his points outside of 10 feet with his stellar footwork and with his incredibly reliable jump shot. McAdoo led the league in scoring for three consecutive seasons from 1974 to 1976, getting as high as 34.5 in 1975. He did eventually win two NBA championships in his twilight years as a solid scoring spark off the bench for the Showtime Lakers in the 1980s. Fifth up is Chris Webber. One of the more recent legends on my list, but Webber absolutely has very good reasons to be here. When people talk about the great power forwards of the 2000s, they always talk about Tim Duncan, Dirk Nowitzki, and Kevin Garnett, as they should. But in the first half of the decade, Weber was legitimately in the conversation for the title of the best power forward in the game, and many people seem to have forgotten that. He was the best passer out of that group and was putting up monstrous stat lines during his prime, and if it wasn't for the league screwing him over in the 2002 West Finals, then he would be known today as an NBA champion and as the superstar who put an end to the Shaq and Kobe dynasty. Next is Mark Price. The six-foot point guard played in the NBA from 1986 to 1998, and his best years were as a member of the Cleveland Cavaliers. Not only did he have an incredibly smooth handle, but Price was simply one of the best pure shooters the game has ever seen. His field goal percentage was just a bit shy of having 50-40-90 career percentages, which is absolutely incredible. Not only was he a near 20 points per game score in his best years, but he was also just slightly behind the league leaders in assists per game. I'm definitely planning on making his own video at some point, and considering his talent, it's quite surprising how overlooked he's become. Seventh on the list is Adrian Dantley. He played in the NBA from 1976 to 1991, and spent his best years as a member of the Utah Jazz and Detroit Pistons. Adrian was a smooth and fundamentally sound 6'5 small forward, whose mid-range game and ability to finish in the paint was consistently among the best of the best. He was a six-time All-Star and a two-time scoring champion. To simply say that Dantley was an underrated scorer would be a gigantic understatement. In 1981, he averaged 30.7 points. The following year, he averaged 30.3 points, and then 30.7 points in 1983, and then 30.6 points in 1984. That's a streak of four straight seasons where he averaged over 30 points per game. The only players who have a longer streak of seasons are Michael Jordan and Wilt Chamberlain. Those are literally the only two players. What's even more impressive is the fact that Dantley shot an insane 56.4% over that four season stretch. That's incredibly efficient, even for a center, but for a 30 points per game small forward, that's basically unheard of. 
Add that to the fact that he was consistently among the most efficient free throw shooters in the league, and yeah, Dantley is clearly underrated. Next up is Dolph Chase. Many players are underrated and underappreciated, but few legends are so underappreciated that most young basketball fans have never even heard of them. That's the category that Shays falls into, as the legend played from 1949 to 1964, spending almost the entirety of his career with the Syracuse Nationals. The 6'8 power forward was a solid scorer, getting as high as 24.9 points per game, and was also an elite rebounder as he led the league in 1951 with 16.4 per game. Despite being a big man, he was also one of the best free throw shooters of league history, as he led the league on three separate occasions, getting as high as 90.4% from the charity stripe. He made 12 All-NBA teams and won the NBA championship in 1955, and he certainly would have been the finals MVP if the award had existed at that point in history. Next is James Worthy. The 6'9 small forward is one of the most overlooked greats of basketball history and was the perfect running mate for Magic Johnson. James loved to run the floor and score in transition and was the most frequent beneficiary of Magic's no-look passes. That wasn't the only way he scored his points though. James was great with his back to the basket and in face-up situations with the opponent as he had one of the quickest first steps the game has ever seen. His unique ability to find his way to the paint led him to have an elite field goal efficiency. He also had the nickname Big Game James Worthy, which was very fitting, considering the fact that he's one of the great big game performers of league history. Like when he was named the 1988 Finals MVP, which capped off his heroic performance in Game 7 against Detroit, where he dropped 36 points, 16 rebounds, and 10 assists on 68% shooting. The Lakers needed every single one of those statistics to win that deciding game by just three points. It always annoys me whenever people refer to Magic Johnson and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar as one of the best duos of league history, because the truth is, they weren't simply just a duo. They were a superstar trio, with James Worthy being the third head on the Showtime Lakers three-headed monster. Lastly is the late, great Elgin Baylor. I saved this guy for last because in my opinion, he's the most underrated player in NBA history. Kobe Bryant put it this way, Elgin Baylor was the Michael Jordan before Michael Jordan and the Julius Irving before Julius Irving. When he wasn't busy serving in the military, he was serving up his opponents, dropping 38.3 points per game in 1962. He also has the all-time record for the most points ever scored in an NBA Finals game when he dropped 61 points against Bill Russell and the Celtics in 1962. Just for good measure, he also snagged 22 rebounds that same game. It's one thing to score like that, but to rebound like Rodman at the same time is mind-boggling. Baylor also has the highest career rebounds per game average for anyone who didn't play at center, with an incredible 13.5 per game. Not only was he not a center, but he stood at only 6 foot 5 inches tall, which makes it even more impressive. No player his size or smaller ever had an average as high as 9 rebounds per game, and Baylor got 13.5. If you ask me, the Laker connection is actually the reason why he's so underrated. Because not only is he so overshadowed by all the other Laker greats, but he's easily the greatest Laker legend to never win an NBA championship. At least in technicality, since he was a member of the 1972 Lakers, but he only played in 9 games that season before his bad knees resulted in him retiring. After the Showtime era of the Magic Johnson-led Lakers, and before the time when Shaq and Kobe ruled the NBA, the Lakers were a team desperately trying to contend, yet very few remember them due to their inability to win a championship. The face of this Lakers team during the mid-1990s was none other than Nick the Quick Van Exel. The 6'1 point guard was drafted in 1993 by the Lakers in the second round with the 37th overall pick, and is one of the more underrated weapons within Lakers history. Being a second round draft pick, Van Exel obviously didn't have the highest expectations coming into the league. With that being said, in reality, he obviously had some major shoes to fill, as he was set up to be the point guard of the future by a franchise who had just recently had success with the legendary Magic Johnson. He became the leader of a pretty talented Lakers squad that included pieces like Cedric Sabalos, Eddie Jones, Eldon Campbell, and Vladi Divac. 
With Van Exel at the helm, this group won as many as 53 games and made it as far as the Western Conference semifinals. But as we all know, that's not enough to be immortalized in Lakers lore. Van Exel was very much a dual threat, as he could score in bunches, but he was also a pretty solid facilitator and would always provide plenty of highlights regardless of which aspect he focused on. A couple examples of this was when he dropped an efficient 40 points against the Sonics in 1995, and when he dished out a remarkable 23 assists against the Grizzlies in 1997, which is still the highest assist total in Lakers history by anyone not named Magic Johnson. He was also one of the elite ball handlers of his era, as he had nearly everything in his bag of tricks, including a devastating hesitation dribble and one of the greatest crossover dribbles that the league has ever seen. When people talk about the all-time great ball handlers, they usually discuss guys like Allen Iverson, Jamal Crawford, and Kyrie Irving. And honestly, I believe that Van Exel should be in that conversation as well, or at the very least, just a tier below those other guys. Van Exel was electrifying as he penetrated the lane and attacked the basket. He had a stunning layup package and was an all-around remarkable finisher at the rim. Nick wasn't just great around the rim, but from the perimeter as well, as he's one of the all-time great three-point shooters and is currently in the 43rd spot for the most three-pointers made in NBA history. He wasn't just great at standstill jumpers or catch-and-shoot jumpers, but he was insanely efficient at hitting deep jumpers while off-balance, including fallaway jumpers and ridiculous spinning three-pointers. He was also a remarkable shooter off of one foot, whether it be from the mid-range or even from three-point distance and beyond. All of these skills that I've mentioned of his are impressive, but I'm still yet to mention the most incredible and memorable aspect of his legacy. When you talk about the most clutch players in Lakers history, like Kobe Bryant, Jerry West, Magic Johnson, James Worthy, or Robert Ory, it would be a crime to not include Nick Van Exel in that group, as I truly believe that he was one of the most clutch shot makers that the game has ever seen, and anyone who was actually watching basketball in the mid-90s can testify to this. A big reason why Van Exel has so many clutch game winners and buzzer beaters is because of his great sense of concentration and because of his extreme body control, as he was never too off balance to bury a shot. Making as many clutch shots as he did is impressive enough in itself, but the degree of difficulty in many of those shots is what will always stick out in my memory. Unfortunately, in the days he played, the NBA didn't track many clutch stats like they do today. But you can simply tell from the compilation of game winners that I've been showing throughout that the guy is certainly up there for the most clutch fourth quarter baskets. Although most of these timely baskets came in his days in Los Angeles, there were still many others in his time with the Denver Nuggets and eventually the Dallas Mavericks. Now to be clear, Van Exel wasn't considered as a superstar when he played in the NBA, but really as a star at best, as he made only one all-star team in the 1997-98 season. He was also never considered as an elite defensive player, as larger point guards often took advantage of his smaller frame. Although he was never among the NBA's league leaders in scoring, it doesn't change the fact that he's one of the most offensively skilled players that the game has seen, and that he had a clutch gene greater than 99% of the competitors who've played in this league. At his peak, he was a near 20 points per game score and averaged nearly double digit assists. Seeing how his game relied heavily upon his quickness and athleticism, he didn't end up having a very long basketball career. Injuries to his knees and elbows played a part as well, and by the time he was 34 years old, he had played his final game in the NBA. He never won a championship, which plays a part in why he's rarely talked about, and it's unfortunate that he was traded from the Lakers for Tony Batiste in 1998, because the Shaq and Kobe Lakers often struggled to provide solid production from the point guard position, and Van Exel was a player who seemed to complement Shaquille O'Neal quite well in the couple seasons they actually played together. The Lakers were very stacked with guards at that time, with guys like an emerging Kobe Bryant, Derek Fisher, and Eddie Jones. So with that many ball handlers and scores, the Lakers may have seen that as a legitimate reason to part ways with Van Exel in order to create more opportunities for their young stars. Plus, Van Exel did have some chemistry issues with the strong personalities in LA. The biggest issue came in the 1997-98 NBA season. The Lakers finished that regular season with a 61-21 record and the team had championship aspirations. 
All four of the Lakers stars, Shaquille O'Neal, Kobe Bryant, Eddie Jones, and Nick Van Exel, made the NBA's all-star team, and only a handful of teams have ever achieved four selections in the same season. The thing is, when the Lakers got to the Western Conference Finals against the Utah Jazz, things were not going nearly as well as they had hoped. The Lakers lost the first game in Utah by a whopping 45 points. They went on to lose games two and three as well by close deficits. Although many of the Lakers played poorly, Van Exel didn't do much to help, as he shot 1 of 9 in Game 1, 4 of 12 in Game 2, and 2 of 13 in Game 3. Facing a 3-0 deficit, the Lakers had to fight with everything they had in order to keep their finals hopes alive, but one player wasn't very optimistic. At the end of the Lakers practice before Game 4, nearly every player huddled up, put their hands in the middle, and in unison said 1, 2, 3, team, which they had done throughout the entirety of the season. The thing is, that's not what Van Exel said. In a jokingly manner, he stated 1, 2, 3, Cancun, implying that the Lakers were on their way to a vacation in Cancun after being eliminated. According to Jeff Perlman's book, Three Ring Circus, the gym went dead quiet. Kobe Bryant looked at his teammate as if he had just spoiled milk. Rick Fox was equally disgusted, whispering, can you believe this expletive? Even Eddie Jones, Van Exel's friend, was taken aback. What the hell was that about, he asked. O'Neal went directly to general manager Jerry West's office to tell him of the incident, to which the veteran executive said bluntly, after this all ends, Nick is done here. With that story in perspective, it really seems like there was no way of mending the relationship between Van Exel and the Lakers, seeing how the team was made up of fierce competitors and Nick basically just quit on the group. Regardless, the exchange for Tony Batie and Tyron Liu for Nick Van Exel is certainly one of the worst trades in Lakers history, at least in terms of talent. Ultimately, it's not like the Lakers organization should have a statue made of him outside of Crypto.com Arena. But at the same time, many Lakers fans and NBA fans act like basketball didn't exist in Los Angeles between the Showtime era and the Shaq and Kobe era. But I'm here to tell you that it was actually a very memorable era, filled with many highlights and many late game heroics. Thanks first and foremost to this man, the most clutch Laker that no one talks about. Most of you already know full well that the game of basketball has changed tremendously throughout the years. Arguably the most dramatic and drastic change has been the rise and the prominence of the three-point shot. There's several reasons for the rise of the three-pointer, from the way the rules have changed, to the way the analytics have evolved, and even to the confidence of the players building in terms of what kind of shots they can consistently hit efficiently. With all this being said, there are certain players of years past who made their impact with perimeter shooting at a time where it wasn't even that common. These are the kind of players who fantasize about playing in the modern game, where their skills would have been allowed to shine to an even greater extent, and where they would have been a much hotter commodity in the free agency market. There are many players who fit this description that I won't be mentioning in the video, just because there's too many of them, but here's 8 players who stand out to me as guys who would love to play in today's game. First off, possibly the most obvious choice, Reggie Miller. Reggie is one of the greatest three-point shooters of all time and is one of only eight players to make the illustrious 50-40-90 club, which means he shot at least 50% from the field, 40% from three-point range, and 90% from the free throw line over the course of an entire season. It's not just that Reggie made a lot of threes, but it's how he made his threes that make him such a smooth transition to today's game. Reggie spent the majority of his playing time on offense zipping all over the court trying to get the ball for a clean look, very similar to the way Steph Curry currently plays. Reggie wore out his defenders because they knew, even in the 90s where significantly less three-pointers were taken, you couldn't give him just a second of daylight because he was going to make you pay for it. In 80s and 90s basketball, you saw a ton of players who were set shooters. They would catch the ball in a stationary position and they shot the ball going straight up and straight down. But now, you're seeing a lot of players shooting as they're coming off screens, and sometimes they're turning to face the basket as they're leaping to take their shot. At times, they're even a little off balance while doing it, but if their shoulders are square and the follow through is true to form, then it's still very likely to go in. Reggie made a living playing this way, just like modern players do. The major difference is that now, Reggie would have an even bigger green light and would shoot significantly more three-pointers. 
Let's use one of his best seasons as an example. In the 1989-90 season, Reggie averaged 24.6 points on 51.4% shooting and 41.4% from three-point range on 4.4 three-point attempts per game. Now here's the crazy part. This season that Reggie put up these numbers, teams as a whole were shooting only 6.6 threes per game. Now, in today's game, they're shooting 34.1. That's more than five times the amount of three-pointers shot in Miller's season. So I think it's fair to assume that Reggie would shoot at least twice as many three-pointers if he played today. And it's scary to think about what that could have done for his game. Second up is one of the forgotten snipers of NBA history, Dale Ellis. Dale was a bit of a journeyman as he played for six different teams over the course of his career. With that being said, he was a legitimate star during his days with the Seattle Supersonics. He was always a great shooter as he shot 40.3% from three-point range over the course of his career. But where he really stood out was in the 1988-89 season where he had one of the most underrated seasons of basketball history as he scored 27.5 points, 4.2 rebounds, and 1.3 steals on 50.1% shooting and an absurd 47.8% from three-point range. In his career, he participated in seven three-point contests, winning the event in his impressive 1989 season. Remember the famous bit of trash talk where Larry walked into the locker room on All-Star Weekend before the three-point shootout and said, which one of you guys is coming in second? Well, that was usually Dale Ellis. Next up is Craig Hodges. Craig played in the NBA from 1982 to 1992 and spent most of his years as a member of the Chicago Bulls. He was always basically just a role player as he never averaged more than 11 points per game and in only one season did he exceed 30 minutes per game. But in terms of pure shooting ability, he's easily one of the greatest of all time. He's arguably the greatest three-point contest performer of all time as well. He won the event in three straight seasons from 1990 to 1992. If you adjust for inflation, his 25 points in the event is still the league's record. He shot 40% from three-point distance over his career with several seasons where he came close to exceeding 50%. It's astonishing that a player who was as deadly of a shooter as Hodges only shot an average of two three-point attempts per game, but that just tells you how different the eras were. Fourth is Chris Mullen. The 6'6 small forward was the star of the Warriors franchise well before they became a bandwagon destination. He shot 38.4% over his career from three-point range and came extremely close to a 50-40-90 season several times. Mullen wasn't just a great shooter, but a great scorer all around as he averaged at least 25 points per game for five straight seasons. In his prime, he was good enough to make the illustrious Dream Team, who most consider the greatest basketball team ever assembled. But he wasn't just some ordinary piece to the puzzle in those Olympics, but he was actually the team's best shooter by a mile. He was second in three-point attempts, just slightly behind Larry Bird, but he shot a ridiculous 53.8% from that distance while being the team's fourth highest scorer, doing more than his part to secure the gold medal. Five and six on the list are Jack Sigma and Bill Lambeer. Both of these guys were 6'11 centers and are considered as two of the original stretch bigs of the NBA. Sigma had his best seasons from a statistical standpoint in his early years with Seattle, but it wasn't until his final few seasons in his mid-30s with Milwaukee where he suddenly started shooting a significant amount of three-pointers, and in those three seasons, he shot 35.6%. To even further emphasize how rare these big men shooters were, in each of those three seasons, only two centers were in the top 50 of three-pointers made, Jack Sigma, and the other was Bill Lambeer. Bill is most famous for his violent style of basketball as a member of the Bad Boy Pistons. But outside of that, he would actually love playing in the modern era of basketball, as he was not only a great rebounder, but a solid three-point shooter, who often successfully ran the pick and pop with Isaiah Thomas. That's a skill set and play style that would be even more prioritized if he played today. Seventh is Mark Price, who's one of the more underrated stars of basketball history. The six-foot point guard played all of his prime years as a member of the Cavaliers, and in those years, he was frequently among the league leaders in three-point attempts, as well as being a fantastic facilitator and ball handler. With Price's abilities to handle the rock and shoot off the dribble, he would certainly love to play in today's NBA where that is even more common and encouraged. 
He was basically the model of efficiency, as he is one of the eight members of the 50-40-90 club, which came from his 1988-89 season where he averaged 18.9 points and 8.4 assists on 53% shooting, 44% from three, and 90% from the free throw line. As impressive as that single season was, what might be even more impressive is how he was close to doing a 50-40-90 career, 47% from the field, 40% from three, and 90% from the free throw line. Next on the list might seem like a bit of a head scratcher, but let me explain. Pistol Pete Maravich. The Pistol was one of the greatest scorers of NBA history, and with his fast break style and incredible ball handling skills, he was very ahead of his time. It might seem weird to suggest a player on this list of three-point shooters who played almost the entirety of his career in the 70s before the three-point shot even existed. With that being said, many who saw him play in those days testified to the fact that he certainly had the range. He had a very beautiful shooting form that looks like modern-day shooting mechanics. In 1977, he averaged 31.1 points as a perimeter shooting guard with no three-point line. I can only imagine what kind of numbers he would have put up if there was a three-point line. The highlight of that season came in a game against the New York Knicks, where he dropped a career-high 68 points. Based on the spots from many of his jumpers that night, his total would have likely been well into the 70s if he had a three-point line. His final season was at just 32 years old. It was the 1979-1980 season, which was the NBA's first ever season with the three-point shot. He was well past his prime at this point and was dealing with knee problems. In that small sample size of his career, he made 10 out of his 15 three-point attempts, which is a remarkable 66%. One can only wonder what his career percentage would have been if the three-point line had always been available to him. So recently, Tracy McGrady has been making headlines as he's been having some strong takes in recent days. One of his recent statements that gained attention was when T-Max said that he was in the same conversation with Kobe Bryant during his prime. And my response is, He ain't lying. I wouldn't even classify this as an opinion from T-Mac. It's just a fact. How do I know this? Because I was there making these debates with my friends in the early to mid 2000s. My buddy Chuck, who was 30 at the time, had been watching the game for 20 years up to that point and he was always on Team McGrady. And of course, I argued on behalf of Kobe. I also had a friend in high school that was named Matt, who was religiously debating on behalf of McGrady. Yet, if you go on Twitter, you'll see a bunch of people claiming that McGrady's delusional. He's making stuff up for clout, and this guy specifically even compares him to Paul Pierce for his take. And sadly, 51 casual fans actually agreed with him. I saw people even saying that they were never in the same conversation because Kobe was a leader who won, and McGrady was a guy who was constantly getting bounced in the first round. Simply put, this is revisionist history. You have to remember that narratives and stigmas are shaped over time. In the 2002-2003 season, Kobe was putting up these numbers. But a cocky 24-year-old Kobe was not being viewed as a leader. People thought he was a diva, a selfish ball hog, and a guy whose ego wouldn't let him accept his role as a Robin to Shaq's Batman. Many people believed he was a disruption to the locker room chemistry, which is vastly different from the label of a leader. And honestly, those criticisms may have not been inaccurate. Considering how his coach Phil Jackson retired a year later and wrote this book where he slandered Kobe's lack of teamwork numerous times. Sure, the Mamba had won three championships at that point, but he did that with Shaq as the finals MVP. And at that time, the narrative was firmly in place that Kobe couldn't win a ring without Shaq. Kobe hadn't proven otherwise just yet. On the other hand, in the 02-03 season, you had a 23-year-old McGrady who put up these numbers and was the league's leading scorer. At this point, the stigma didn't yet exist that McGrady was damned to be a loser who couldn't get past the first round. For goodness sake, he was just 23 years old and was just starting to show what he could do when he wasn't under Vince Carter's shadow in Toronto. Then you have to consider the different situations. McGrady didn't have the supporting cast that Kobe did, and everyone knew that in 2003. 
Kobe's second leading scorer was the all-time great Shaquille O'Neal, who was a recent league MVP and was one of the most dominant bigs the game had ever seen. McGrady's second leading scorer was Mike Miller, who never made a single All-Star team. I'm not trying to argue that McGrady was better in that specific time period, but I'm just trying to show why many other people had valid reasons to believe he was. People's denial and ignorance about this generational debate made me wonder what are some other debates that once took place that younger fans today would have a hard time believing. So let's close this chapter on McGrady and Kobe and dive into the next one. Chris Paul vs. Darren Williams Nowadays, I kinda wonder how many young fans even know who Darren Williams is. At the time, the comparisons were only natural, as both players were selected in the 2005 NBA Draft. Williams was taken third overall by the Utah Jazz, and Paul was taken fourth overall by the New Orleans Hornets. Both of these players were talented floor generals who didn't take very long to have a tremendous impact in the NBA. Both players were leading superstar point guards for their Western Conference contenders. I think most people were usually on Team Paul, and I know I certainly was, as I always felt like he had the edge defensively. But over a four-year stretch, it was a very legitimate comparison, as their offensive numbers were nearly identical over that time. The reason the comparison fell off and became forgotten, for the most part, is because quite frankly, Williams had one of the most drastic drop-offs that the game of basketball has ever seen. He did have some injuries that affected his career, like his wrist surgery in 2011 and various ankle injuries. The decline in his production was sharp, and he became a bit of a journeyman in his twilight years. By the time he was 32 years old, he had played his final game in the NBA as a bench-riding afterthought for LeBron's 2017 Cleveland Cavaliers. Again, his peak was a four-year stretch for a small market team and a loaded Western Conference. So it kind of makes sense why this comparison has become somewhat lost in history. But ask anyone who was an NBA fan in the late 2000s and the early 2010s, and they'll tell you about the arguments they had between these two point guards. One other quick comparison that people have forgotten was Vince Carter versus Kobe Bryant. Just a couple of years before T-Mac and Kobe were causing arguments, this was one of the hottest debates in all of basketball. When it comes to the early years of Kobe's career, there seems to be a lot of revisionist history regarding his comparisons to Michael Jordan. Yes, Kobe was often compared to MJ, but Kobe was also a bit of a slow bloomer, who didn't average north of 20 points per game until his fourth season in the NBA. On the other hand, Vince Carter was more NBA ready upon entering the league. And for a while, I remember him being referred to as the next Michael Jordan way more than Kobe was. He was the high-flying acrobat who was drafted from North Carolina just like MJ, and even the Air Canada nickname also served as a direct reference to the Air Jordan nickname. Kobe and Vince had tremendous battles in the early 2000s, and for a while, it seemed as if most people were on Team Carter. I know this next part seems to be a silly piece of evidence, but I honestly think it's a pretty good indicator of how the two stars were viewed back in the day. This is my Beckett Price Guide magazine from August 2000. These magazines tell you the market value of NBA trading cards. This magazine was printed just after Kobe Bryant won his first championship. And yet, basically every single set of basketball cards had Vince Carter's cards at a greater value than Kobe Bryant's. The holy grail of Vince Carter's rookie cards was his 98-99 SP Authentic, which was valued at $1,000. The must-have Kobe Bryant rookie card was his 96-97 Topps Chrome, and that was listed at only $500. Now, this is the latest Beckett Price Guide magazine, which is listed as August 2023. That same Vince Carter rookie card is now valued at only $400, and that Kobe Bryant Topps Chrome rookie card is now listed at $1,500. Oh, how things can change in a couple of decades. Again, it's a silly and specific comparison, but I'm telling you, from 1999 to 2001, Vince Carter was the guy that many people were assuming would eventually become the face of the NBA. And to a certain extent, 
he already was. Heading into the summer of 2004, the Lakers were coming off of a tumultuous season that had championship expectations yet ended in defeat on the game's biggest stage. Shaq and Kobe's personal beef had grown sour to the point of no return, and with the diesel aging, the front office found themselves in a position where they had to choose one star or the other. Ultimately, they traded the 32-year-old Shaquille O'Neal to the Miami Heat, while Kobe was signed to a 7-year, $136 million contract. Former All-Stars like Karl Malone and Gary Payton also left Los Angeles, which meant that Kobe was left with a roster with below-average talent. The newly acquired Lamar Odom was the best supporting piece that the Mamba had, and many writers and analysts in Los Angeles were saying that Odom was going to be the Scottie Pippen to Kobe's Michael Jordan. Obviously, those were shoes way too big for him to fill, and the Lakers would struggle out of the gates. Former NBA champion head coach Rudy Tomjanovich was hired to be the replacement head coach of Phil Jackson, and was given a 5-year $30 million contract. He barely saw any of that time though, as Rudy decided to resign from the team only 43 games into the season due to his mental and physical exhaustion. Los Angeles was decent with Rudy as they started the year with a 24-19 record, but they absolutely imploded after he left as they closed out the rest of the season with a 10-29 record, falling well short of the playoff picture. Kobe clearly didn't have the help he needed, and Los Angeles finished as one of the worst teams defensively. Regardless of the subpar supporting cast, the narrative was now firmly established among the media that Kobe can never win a championship ring without Shaquille O'Neal. Over the next two seasons, Kobe started making history on an individual level, as he dropped 81 points in a game against the Raptors, 62 points in three quarters versus the Mavericks, and four straight 50-point games. The thing is, the supporting cast was still awful, as below-average players like Chris Mim, Kwame Brown, Luke Walton, and Smush Parker were consistently in the starting rotation. Regardless of the lack of legitimate support, Kobe's MVP caliber performances willed the Lakers to the playoffs in back-to-back -back seasons, but in both years, they were eliminated out of the first round by the Phoenix Suns. This was an extremely rare low moment for the Lakers franchise, as their season ended in the first round or worse three years in a row. Kobe was beyond frustrated and was extremely critical of not only his teammates, but of the Lakers' upper management. He was completely done carrying the organization on his back, so Bryant then decided to publicly demand a trade. The narrative that he couldn't win without Shaq was now more prominent than ever before, and even Los Angeles locals like Bill Plaschke from the LA Times was preaching this narrative as well. Bill, have the Lakers reached a point of no return with Kobe Bryant? Well, let's see. He's ripped the general manager. He's ripped the owner. He's ripped other players. He's basically ripped the city by saying he don't want to play here. Hmm, I think they've reached a point of no return. Hello, Lakers, trade him now. It's beyond the point of no return. How much abuse can they take from one guy? And you know, at what point does does his value on the court be offset by how much a huge attraction he is off the court and the fact that even on the court, they can't win with him. They've already shown it. They cannot win with him. He doesn't make players around him better. Trade him now. Maybe have a chance to rebuild. The Lakers are about winning. They've never been about selfishness. They've never been about one person. They've always been about a team, about winning. Get rid of him now because you can't win with him. Fortunately for LA fans, the Lakers management didn't take Bill's advice and decided to keep the Mamba against his will. Regardless, a lot of Laker fans were actually on Plaschke's side and was sick of Bryant's drama and displeasure with the organization. So when the Lakers 07-08 season finally began, the fans let Kobe hear it and Staples Center was booing Kobe during player introductions. I repeat, the Staples Center crowd in Los Angeles was booing their own superstar, Kobe Bryant, who had helped them win three championships up to that point. Kobe went on to score 45 points in that game, but the Lakers still lost to Houston, which basically continued the theme of the previous three seasons. The once prestigious Lakers organization was now being seen as a joke of a franchise, as everyone on the team now seemed at odds with each other, and even the fans were at odds with the superstar that they paid to watch. Even though management decided to keep Kobe for now, it only seemed as if it was a matter of time before the Mamba left in free agency when his contract eventually expired. 
nearly every glimmer of hope within the Lakers organization was immediately dashed to pieces. And another example of this was their young emerging center, Andrew Bynum, who suffered a season-ending knee injury against the Grizzlies just 35 games into the year. It appeared as if another depressing conclusion to the season was approaching. Through all the constant tension and drama in Los Angeles, the Lakers managed to start the year with a 29-16 record, good enough for the fifth seed in the Western Conference. Regardless of the fact that they were destined for the playoffs, the feeling among basketball circles remained the same, that Kobe and the Lakers were on their way to an early playoff exit, and the trade demands would heat up yet again. This is when the move finally happened that changed the course of Bryant's career, the Lakers' future, and the history of basketball. Jerry West and Mitch Kupchak of the Lakers' front office achieved one of the greatest midseason basketball trades of all time. The Lakers acquired the all-star big man Pau Gasol from the Memphis Grizzlies in exchange for Kwame Brown, Javaris Crittenton, Aaron McKee, and the draft rights to Marc Gasol. This move sent shockwaves throughout the league, as the Lakers went instantly from an expected first-round exit to a contender in the Western Conference. Many people believed this acquisition would lead to great things for Los Angeles, but before everyone was convinced, Gasol had to be seen on the floor with the rest of his new squad. The first impression was about as strong as it could have been. On February 5, 2008, Gasol made his Laker debut in a matchup against the New Jersey Nets. He completely controlled the game with 24 points, 12 rebounds, and 4 assists on 67% shooting. The play on the court was beautiful to witness, as the Lakers veterans gelled together as if they had been teammates for years. But on an individual level, Kobe had a horrible game, as he was dealing with an injured finger and only scored 6 points on 3 of 13 shooting from the field and 7 turnovers. You wouldn't know it though if I hadn't told you, as the Lakers won the game comfortably 105-90. Nobody was happier with the outcome and the state of the team than the player who struggled the most, Kobe Bryant. In the post-game interview, Bryant was asked about his thoughts on his new co-star, and this is what he had to say. Kobe, how nice a feeling is it to know that you can score six points and still have a victory come out? You have no idea. It, you know, just make the game so much easier. You know, we had some weapons before. Now we just added a huge one to the team, and uh, we get big buying them back. It's, it's, you know, there's a God. <laughs> there is a God. Kobe proclaiming that there is indeed a God indicates that he understood the magnitude of the acquisition. The energy completely changed around the Lakers organization overnight, as the feeling of impending despair shifted to hope and optimism. Obviously, Kobe's stance on his trade request was revisited after Powell was in LA, and when asked if the Gasol acquisition strengthened his desire to stay in LA, Kobe responded with a smirk on his face, saying this. Uh, it doesn't hurt. Absolutely not. To say that Powell was pivotal to the Lakers' success from that point on would be a massive understatement. Even though Gasol was naturally a power forward, he filled the role of the injured Andrew Bynum at the center position throughout the 08 season. Ultimately, the Lakers lost the 2008 NBA Finals in six games to the Boston Celtics, but Gasol would only continue to be an anchor for the team for their next two seasons. In the 08-09 season, Andrew Bynum once again went down with a devastating knee injury, which again moved Gasol to the center position for the majority of the season. In that postseason, Powell averaged 18 points and 11 rebounds on a remarkably efficient 58% shooting from the field. Next year's playoffs was more of the same, and in the NBA Finals matchup against the Boston Celtics, Powell led all players in rebounds and blocks and was second overall in scoring. In the hard-fought seventh game, Gasol dropped 19 points, 18 rebounds, and 4 assists. Not only was he crucial to winning that decisive game, but many people think he deserved the Finals MVP for his contribution in that series. Thanks to his efforts, the Lakers won the NBA championship in back-to-back -back seasons. Simply put, if it wasn't for Gasol, Kobe doesn't have any rings without Shaq, forever tarnishing his legacy. If it wasn't for Gasol, the Lakers likely never get out of that awful post-Shaq era, which would have been a huge hit to the Lakers' brand and reputation. This is why the Lakers retired his jersey, because he saved the franchise from the dark depths of mediocrity.
and restore the team to the glory that they've become so accustomed to. So there's been many different eras in basketball history, and in specifically the 80s, that decade is known for a few major aspects. Magic Johnson and Larry Bird's rivalry, the beginning of Michael Jordan's career, and of course, the Bad Boy Pistons. But outside of that, there's still many talented teams and players who don't get the attention they deserve. Today, upon viewer request, I'm diving into the Western Conference in the 1980s as we evaluate how good and how deep that conference was at this period. We're starting off with the most obvious team, the Los Angeles Lakers. They were a legitimate super team led by their trio of Magic Johnson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, and James Worthy. We already know a ton about the first two. Magic Johnson was the greatest point guard of basketball history, who led the Lakers' fast pace and high-octane offense to earn the nickname Showtime. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, known as the captain, was still an elite center in the league, although he was past his prime days of the 1970s. Still, he fit in beautifully as a big man in Magic's fast break. And when the Lakers chose to slow it down, there was no better way to get a sure bucket than dropping it into the post where Kareem could use his indefensible sky hook shot. The guy who's the most underrated one in this mix is big game James Worthy, whose nickname was very fitting considering the fact that he was one of the most clutch performers the game has ever seen. He averaged around 20 points per game during his prime, and the 6'9 small forward had one of the quickest first steps the game has ever seen. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. James Worthy deserves his own statue outside of Staples Center. Without him, the Lakers certainly don't win the 1998 NBA championship over the Pistons in seven games. In that seventh and deciding game, James dropped 36, 16, and 10 on 68% shooting and was named the finals MVP of that series. Along with that all-time great trio, they also had a significant amount of depth, including their 6'5 shooting guard, Michael Cooper, who was a part of all five of their championship runs that decade. Cooper was one of the original 3 and D type of players, and he's one of the great defensive players that most young viewers have never heard of. He made eight straight all-defense teams that decade and was the 1987 Defensive Player of the Year. They also had a quality transition scorer in Byron Scott, and they also had a six-man of the year candidate, Michael Thompson, in the second half of the decade. Considering how overpowered this juggernaut was, it's no wonder they represented the West in the NBA Finals eight out of 10 seasons. The second team we're looking at is the Houston Rockets. They were not great in the first half of the decade, but after acquiring Hakeem Olajuwon in the 1984 draft, that all would quickly change. The twin tower combination of Ralph Sampson and Hakeem Olajuwon quickly made them prominent contenders in the West. They also had key scoring sparks like Lewis Lloyd and Robert Reed. They made it as far as the NBA Finals in 1986, and after they had defeated the favored Lakers in the West Finals, the hype around this team was immense. With Hakeem at the age of 23 and Sampson at the age of 25, it seemed as if it was only a matter of time before the league was theirs. Unfortunately, their success was short-lived, and so was the career of Sampson, as he began dealing with significant back and knee problems that had him out of the league by the time he was barely into his 30s. The next team is one of the less talked about and fascinating gems of the 1980s, and that's the Denver Nuggets. They were led by two solid and relatively unknown stars, Alex English and Fat Lever. Of all the players in the entirety of the 1980s, no one scored more total points than Alex English, who averaged as high as 29.8 points per game in 1986. He was an incredibly efficient 6'7 small forward who had a lethal mid-range jump shot with an extremely high release point that was rarely blocked, which led him to make eight straight all-star teams in that era. His co-star was the 6'3 point guard slash shooting guard Lafayette Lever, known as Fat Lever for short. Lever was a pretty good distributor and a reliable scorer who was very close to 20 points per game during his prime. With this duo leading the way, Denver had an extremely fast and potent offense. In 6 out of the 10 seasons that decade, Denver led all teams in points scored. They were a contender, and they had a potential championship team if it wasn't for one major problem. They were terrible defensively, and when I say terrible, I mean excruciatingly awful. The concept was basically that the best defense was more offense. Every season that decade, they finished as a bottom five team in points allowed, including four straight seasons where they were the worst in the entire league. Despite all of their defensive woes, this team still made it to the conference semifinals four times, and they made it to the Western Conference Finals in 1985, where they lost in five games to the eventual champion Los Angeles Lakers. Then there was the Utah Jazz, who were among the worst teams in the league for the first half of the decade. But around the mid-80s is when they added Carl Malone and John Stockton, and their fortunes began to shift. 
Malone and Stockton are most famously known for their two trips to the NBA Finals in 1997 and 1998, but their best season statistically actually came in the late 80s. Nobody really reflects on the 80s Jazz as a Big 3 team, but you could, considering the underrated big man they had down low, the 7 foot 4 inch monster, Mark Eaton. Despite not being very well known, Mark was one of the greatest defensive players to ever live. To say that it was difficult to score over Mark in the paint would be a massive understatement, as he made five all-defense teams, was the Defensive Player of the Year twice, and he led the league in blocks four times, including the 1985 season, where he averaged 5.6 blocks per game. Officially, that's the highest blocks per game average for a season in NBA history. They also had one of the forgotten great leapers of years past, the 6'4 shooting guard Daryl Griffith. Daryl could score, and he had a reliable jump shot, but what he was known for, more than anything, was his incredible dunks, which earned him the nickname Dr. Dunkenstein. He wasn't a great defensive player, but he scored over 20 points a game for his first five seasons. Unfortunately, injuries shortened his career, and he began having those injuries right around the time that Malone and Stockton joined the team, so their prime didn't quite overlap, as he was only a 10 to 15 points per game score by the time that Malone and Stockton broke out as superstars. Despite being rich in talent, they still were not able to get past Magic Johnson's super team, getting as far as Game 7 of the 1988 West Semifinals where the eventual champion Lakers closed it out. Another team who was making deep runs in the West playoffs was the well-balanced Dallas Mavericks. Their leading star was the elite scorer, Mark Aguirre, who spent his prime eight seasons with the Dallas Mavericks before he eventually won two championships with the Bad Boy Pistons. He put up strong numbers in his years as a Maverick, averaging as high as 29.5 points per game in 1984. His co-star was the reliable and consistently good scorer, Rolando Blackman. The 6'6 guard was another one of those great mid-range shooters of the 80s, and his prime years saw about 20 points per game on over 50% shooting. Some great role players got their start there as well, like one of the original stretch four shooters, the 6'9 Sam Perkins, and a future six man of the year, the 6'10 Detlef Schrempf. At their best three-year stretch with their many weapons, this unit was seen as a legitimate threat to the Lakers, and in 1988, they made it to the Western Conference Finals where they pushed Magic, Kareem, and Worthy's Lakers to seven games before Los Angeles closed it out. The last one to highlight is more so a player than an entire team, and that's the 6'10 power forward Tom Chambers. He was a four-time All-Star and one of the premier scorers of that decade. His greatest performance was a 60-point explosion in a revenge game against his former team. He was an incredible athlete who could play above the rim and has one of the most ridiculous looking dunks of all time. He spent most of his years in the 80s with the Seattle Supersonics, but it wasn't until he joined the Phoenix Suns that he got his first taste of competing. In 1989, Chambers and Kevin Johnson led the Suns to a 55-27 record while Chambers was averaging over 25 points per game. They then cruised to the Western Conference Finals before they were swept by the defending champion Lakers. These were pretty much all of the competing teams in the Western Conference during the 80s. Although I do think there were some pretty solid teams, and you could certainly argue that the West 80s was underrated, they certainly weren't as strong as the fiercely competitive Eastern Conference. In the 1980s, there were 25 50-win teams in the Western Conference. In the 80s for the Eastern Conference, there was 35 50-win teams, which pretty much sums up the balance of power during that decade. And that's certainly interesting because it's arguably the last decade we've seen where the East was stronger than the West. The West in the 80s certainly wasn't one of the greatest conferences we've ever seen, but due to the rich Eastern Conference in that decade, and due to the overpowered Lakers representing the West in the NBA Finals 8 out of 10 years, there have unfortunately been some nice teams and quality players who've become lost and overlooked in the game's history. William Felton Russell, more commonly known as Bill Russell, is one of the most iconic legends of NBA history. He's widely recognized as the game's ultimate winner, as he has more championship rings than any other player of league history with a total of 11. Despite having more rings than fingers, Russell has significantly less hardware than he actually deserves, since he played in the NBA at a time when many accolades and awards had not yet been invented. Honors like the NBA's All-Defensive Teams, the Defensive Player of the Year Award, and the Finals MVP did not exist throughout the vast majority of Bill Russell's career. 
He already has a dominant resume worthy of putting himself in the GO argument, but his incredible body of work only becomes tremendously more impressive once you consider the additional awards he likely would have accumulated if they had always been available. Today, we're taking a look at Russell's career and considering its magnificence when the additional accolades are applied to his legacy. First off, let's start by considering Russell's impact and reputation as a defensive player. Bill is respected and remembered for his elite rebounding, his clutch gene, and for his team-first approach. But above all else, Russell is revered for his tenacious and dominating presence on the defensive end, as many of his peers, fans, and basketball enthusiasts in general consider him as the greatest defensive player of NBA history. Unfortunately, the Defensive Player of the Year award did not exist until 1982, and blocks and steals were not an officially tracked stat until 1973, which means there is a lot of details that we don't know about his career defensively. But with that being said, there is a decent amount that we do know about what he achieved defensively. Bill played a total of 13 seasons in the NBA, and during that stretch, he led the NBA in defensive win shares in 11 out of those 13 seasons, in some instances even doubling the amount of defensive win shares as the closest competitor. At one point, he led the league in defensive win shares for an entire decade straight. Remember, this was in the same era when Wilt Chamberlain was also playing his prime basketball, and Russell still had a stranglehold on the league defensively. Wilt finished ahead of Bill in defensive win shares in only one season of his career, and more often than not, it wasn't even close in Russell's favor. Not only that, but his defensive presence in the paint was showing up in the results for his team as well, as Russell's Celtics finished as the NBA's number one ranked defense in 12 out of his 13 seasons in the league. His defensive impact was so strong that his Celtics were able to win the NBA championship on three occasions while simultaneously being the worst team in the league offensively, which they did in 1961, 1963, and 1964. No other team in league history has ever done that. The Celtics also had the best overall record in the entire NBA in 9 out of his 13 seasons. Remember, Bill Russell won five league MVP awards, which is the second most in NBA history, and he won those awards mostly as an acknowledgement of his supreme defense, despite being relatively limited offensively. So it's fair to ask, how many accolades do you think he would have got if they were exclusively about his defense? To put it simply, Russell would have absolutely dominated the Defensive Player of the Year award like no one else has in all of history. He played less than 69 games in only one of his 13 seasons, which means he was almost always eligible for the awards. Based on what we know, on the low end, he's winning as few as 8 Defensive Player of the Year awards, and on the high end, he's winning as many as 11. Either way, he's easily the all-time leader and Defensive Player of the Year's one, as the current record holder is a total of 4 shared by Dikembe Mutombo and Ben Wallace. Even on the low end, Bill would have at least double the amount of DPOYs compared to the closest defender of league history. He's also likely earning a first-team all-defensive spot in anywhere from 9 to 12 seasons of his career. Regardless of whether it's 9, 10, 11, or 12 selections, it's the most in NBA history. If this was all the case, I honestly believe that Bill Russell would stand out more defensively than Michael Jordan or Wilt Chamberlain do offensively, as there would be absolutely no argument about who the greatest defender to ever live was, and it would be laughable to even suggest otherwise. It's important to note that during Bill Russell's era, the awards were actually voted and decided by the players themselves and not by members of the media like it is today. This means that Russell's dominance defensively wasn't only the perception, but it was also the first-hand on-the-court experience of both his teammates and his opponents, which carries even more weight in my humble opinion. One common perception among players and fans of that generation is that Wilt Chamberlain wasn't always giving 100% effort and energy defensively, and would sometimes visibly take nights off when he wasn't feeling as motivated. This was never something that was a concern for Russell. On the contrary, Russell was known to be absolutely obsessive about competing, as he would sometimes build an anxious anticipation in the pregame to the point of vomiting. Russell's all-consuming desire to win undeniably resulted in him giving the most effort possible on the court defensively on a night-to-night -night basis. Another crucial award that did not exist throughout Bill Russell's career was the Finals MVP, 
which is a pretty unfortunate detail for a guy who won 11 championship rings. Michael Jordan certainly has an argument, but Bill Russell may just be the ultimate clutch performer, as he has a perfect 10-0 record in deciding 7th games in the postseason, and he was ridiculously productive in those do-or-die games. The NBA Finals as a whole were not much different, as Russell had a knack for performing his best when games mattered most. I've researched all of his performances in the NBA Finals, and I definitely think he's winning the award in these finals, and he's possibly winning the award in these finals. Which means that on the low end, he's winning as few as 7 finals MVPs, and on the high end, he's winning as many as 10 finals MVPs. Either way, it's the most in NBA history. Now that we've analyzed and broke down all of these factors, let's take a look at Russell's complete resume as it should be. With all of this hardware added to his resume, what do you think it does for his legacy and for his ranking on the NBA's all-time list? I'll just say simply that it would clearly do a lot. For nine seasons of basketball history, the ABA, known as the American Basketball Association, was a competitor to the NBA until the two leagues merged in 1976. During its lifespan, the ABA had around 10 teams in its league. Before the ABA had merged with the NBA, it was a league known for its free-flowing style, its small ball lineups, and it was actually the league that first introduced the three-point shot, which many people in the NBA thought was too gimmicky for a while. Many people in the basketball community, including viewers in my own comment sections, have been debating how the ABA stacked up against the NBA from a competition standpoint during that era. I would certainly love to hear some perspectives from people who are old enough to have witnessed those leagues, so if that's you, please let me know your thoughts in the comment section. The thing is, the NBA all-time lists do not recognize the achievements of the ABA, so all of their points, rebounds, MVPs, championships, and so on don't count towards the player's overall resume, and therefore alters where many great players could rank on the all-time lists. This has been especially devastating to all-time great players who spent time in both the ABA and the NBA. So what if we took into account everything that took place in the ABA as well? whose legacies would be impacted the most. I've evaluated many careers of NBA players, and these are the ones that really stand out. First off, Moses Malone. If you've been following my channel for some time, then you've probably heard me say that Moses Malone is the most underrated center in NBA history. But I've been saying this simply based on what he accomplished in his NBA career. If you include his ABA seasons, he becomes even more impressive. These are the stats and accolades he was able to stack up in the totality of his career of both the NBA and the ABA. With his two ABA seasons included, he goes from 5th on the all-time rebounds list to 3rd overall, only behind Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain. Something that many fans don't know about Moses Malone is that he's easily the greatest offensive rebounder in basketball history. He was an absolute beast when it came to battling for position, securing the boards, and giving his team second chance opportunities. On the NBA's all-time offensive rebounds list, Moses Malone is the history's leader, and no one else is even remotely close. If you include his seasons with the ABA, that gap gets even more dramatic. To even further emphasize how ridiculously dominant he was on the offensive boards, consider this comparison. Kevin Garnett and Moses Malone, both big men who played 21 seasons in their basketball career, and Garnett actually played in seven more games than Moses did. KG is one of the greatest rebounders of all time, and at one point, he won four straight rebounding titles. Yet as impressive as KG was at getting rebounds, Moses has well over twice as many offensive rebounds in his career than Garnett did. If that doesn't tell you how unparalleled Moses was on the offensive boards, then absolutely nothing will. The next player we're looking at is the six-foot point guard Louis Dampier, who played three seasons in the NBA with the San Antonio Spurs, but he played his eight best seasons before that in the ABA with Kentucky. Louis was a great three-point shooter, and when I say great, I mean he was elite even by today's standards. He shot 35.8% from three-point distance over the course of his career, which is good, but the volume is the stunning part. During his prime in 1969, he was shooting 7.1 three-point attempts per game. This is how unique his volume of threes was in that era. In that same season that he averaged 7.1 attempts per game, the league average for an entire team was 5.9 per game. On an individual level, that many attempts would rank him in the top 20 players in today's NBA. If you want to talk about a player who was ahead of his time, there isn't many better examples than Louis, as it was common for him to spot up in the corner for a three, even on a two-on-one fast break. 
In 1969, he made 199 three-pointers over the course of the season, and then followed it up by making 198 in 1970. It took nearly three decades for someone in all of basketball to eclipse that total. He averaged as high as 26 points per game in 1970, and by the end of his ABA career, he was the league's all-time leading scorer with nearly 14,000 points. Many of you have never even heard of this guy before this video, but if ABA achievements counted, many of you would know him as one of the pioneer shooters of the game and as one of the great players of basketball history. Next up is Spencer Haywood. Given enough time and almost every star eventually becomes underrated, but this is definitely a major case for Haywood. His NBA career saw him play with several teams, including the Sonics, the Knicks, and the Lakers. The 6'8 power forward only played one season in the ABA, which was his rookie season, but what a debut season it was. He was an incredibly talented and graceful big man who had fantastic dribbling skills and would often score in spurts with his solid mid-range shooting. In his debut season, he averaged 30 points and 19.5 rebounds on 49.3% shooting. Despite it being only his rookie year, he led the league in points, rebounds, and minutes while playing all 84 games in that regular season. He also led his Denver Rockets to a 51-33 record and was named that season's MVP at only the age of 20. If ABA achievements were acknowledged, then this rookie campaign would be on the short list of the greatest rookie seasons of basketball history. Here's the career accolades of the famous San Antonio Spur, George the Iceman Gervin. Now with the ABA stats included, his all-star appearances and his all-basketball team appearances dramatically increase. The all-time great scoring small forward, Rick Barry, now steeply increases his all-star appearances, his all-basketball team appearances, and goes from 70th place on the all-time scoring list to the 24th spot overall, which now puts him ahead of guys like Jerry West, Allen Iverson, and Dwayne Wade. All-time great center Artis Gilmore strongly improves his resume as he gets more all-star appearances, more rebounding titles, efficiency titles, and climbs significantly up the all-time lists in both scoring and rebounding. Guys like Dan Issel, Connie Hawkins, and Jimmy Jones also significantly improve their legacies. One of the biggest impacts would be how we see the man known as Dr. J, Julius Irving. The doctor had a lot to his game, as the 6'7 small forward was one of the most athletically gifted players the league has ever seen. His unique style, flair, and dominance have led many old school basketball fans to refer to him as the Michael Jordan before there was Michael Jordan. If you want a breakdown of his impact and greatness, then you can watch my How Good Was Julius Irving video. It's no question that the doctor was one of the greatest basketball players to ever live. But if you include his dominant years in the ABA, he now legitimately enters the GOAT conversation, as his championships, his MVPs, his all-star selections, his all-team selections, and even his scoring titles dramatically increase. He also skyrockets from 72nd on the all-time scoring list to the 8th spot overall, putting himself ahead of legends like Moses Malone, Shaquille O'Neal, and Akeem Olajuwon. With all this being said, it's understandable to an extent why the NBA almost never acknowledges the achievements of players from a former league that they were once competing with. There's also the question of competition and the strength of the leagues to consider. So, here's my question to you guys. Do you think the ABA stats and accolades should count on the all-time lists? Should they be treated as the same as all the other stats of the NBA's history? Let me know your thoughts in the comments section. Paul Anthony Pierce an NBA champion and one of the great Celtics of basketball history. A couple years ago, in a statement that probably still haunts him to this day, Pierce said that he was a better player than Dwayne Wade, and most of the basketball community roasted him for it. But is it really as ridiculous as it sounds? Paul has been known to make a lot of bold claims in his time as an analyst, and in my opinion, this one was far from the craziest. Today, we're taking a look at the career, talent, and legacy of the Boston Celtics legend, and we'll start as we always do, by taking it back to the beginning of his career. Pierce was selected with the 10th overall pick in the 1998 NBA Draft by the Boston Celtics. The 6'7 small forward didn't waste any time making his imprint on the league. He wasn't the most athletically gifted player, but he had many skills on offense. As he was an elite perimeter shooter, he was a good finisher around the rim, and he had a solid step back jumper in the days where most players weren't using it. In his rookie season, he averaged 16.5 points, 6.4 rebounds, 2.4 assists, and 1.7 steals on 43.9% shooting. He also shot 41.2% from three-point range, which was the 11th best efficiency in the entire league. This season-long performance earned him a spot on the NBA's All-Rookie Team. 
Boston was a very young and inexperienced team at this point, so they only finished with a 19-31 record in that lockout-shortened season, but their fortunes would soon turn around, right around the same time that Pierce would break out as a legitimate superstar, but not before he would experience one of the worst evenings of his life that would derail many individuals. On September 25th of the year 2000, at a Boston nightclub, three stupid and jealous individuals stabbed Paul Pierce 11 times in his face, his neck, and his back, and left him to die in a pool of his own blood. Fortunately, his teammate Tony Batty put Pierce in his car and rushed him to the hospital. The doctors were able to save Paul's life, but he had to have surgery to repair his collapsed lung. One of the stab wounds was just an inch away from hitting Paul's heart. Everyone would understand Paul needing a significant amount of time to recover, not just physically, but even mentally, as Paul dealt with ongoing PTSD from that evening. Despite the healing process and that traumatic experience, Pierce was still ready at the start of the NBA regular season just roughly a month later. Not only that, but he played all 82 games in that season, proving himself to be one of the toughest players the league has ever seen. One of the signature performances from that season came on March 13, 2001, against the defending champion Lakers in Staples Center. He was pretty much unstoppable, scoring in a variety of ways regardless of who was defending him. He put up 42 points, 6 rebounds, and 4 steals on 68.4% shooting. After the game, Lakers center Shaquille O'Neal was asked in an interview about Pierce's performance, and Shaq said, Write this down, Paul Pierce is the mother effing truth. Since that day, Pierce's most iconic nickname has simply been The Truth. The following season, Pierce would lead his Celtics to their first playoff berth in nearly a decade, and he did it with monstrous numbers of 26.1 points, 6.9 rebounds, 3.2 assists, and 1.9 steals on 44.2% shooting. He was third in the league in overall three-point attempts, and yet he still shot 40.4% from that distance. He also led the entire league in total points that season. The tandem of Pierce and Antoine Walker led the Celtics to a 49-33 record, and they made it through the first two rounds of the playoffs before losing to the New Jersey Nets in the Eastern Conference Finals in six games. This is the closest Pierce would get to the NBA Finals before the Boston Big Three assembled later in his career. With that being said, this period was actually the strongest point of his career from an individual standpoint. After a disappointing 06-07 campaign in which he dealt with injuries, Boston shook the basketball world by trading for both Ray Allen and Kevin Garnett. Naturally, all three superstars including Pierce took a step back in terms of individual production, but it was worth it for the overall team success that they were experiencing. The Celtics went from being a 24-win team in 2007 to a 66-win team in 2008, which was the greatest team improvement in NBA history. Pierce led his entire team in scoring and was once again named an All-Star. As most of you know, he led the Celtics to win the NBA championship over the Lakers in six games, and he was named the Finals MVP with his iconic performance coming in Game 1 where he returned from injury to seal the victory for Boston. More on this performance in a bit. The Celtics only won one championship in the Big Three era, but if they had been healthy, there's a great chance they would have won as many as three championships, as Kevin Garnett's knee injury caused him to miss all of the 2009 playoffs, and Kendrick Perkins missed Game 7 in the NBA Finals in 2010, which was a game where his rebounding and his help with interior defense may have been a determining factor. Regardless, throughout his Celtics days, and even into his days with Brooklyn and Washington, Pierce remained one of the most reliable and clutch shooters that the league had to offer. He finished out his career in 2017 as a member of the Los Angeles Clippers. Looking at his career as a whole, Pierce was a 10-time All-Star, he made four All-NBA teams, he's an NBA champion, and was the 2008 Finals MVP. I really think Pierce was a lot better than most people realize, and a big part of that is because his prime years came before the Big Three Celtics were formed. So many people are either too young to have seen his early years in Boston, or they just weren't paying attention at that point. His self-comparison to Dwayne Wade is a losing one in my opinion. Pierce does have a point that Wade had a lot more help to win his championships, and the help came a little too late for Pierce to win as many championships as he could have. Wade certainly was the better defender, as he's one of the best shot-blocking guards in NBA history who made three all-defense teams, but Pierce was also a significantly better three-point shooter than Wade ever was, and they were comparable scorers throughout their careers. Again, I think the answer is clearly Wade, but the comparison certainly wasn't as bad as a lot of people make it seem. 
To be honest, I've never seen one player innocently do more damage to their legacy than Paul Pierce has done to his own in recent years. Calling himself better than Dwayne Wade immediately invited criticism. And then the fact that he confessed his injury in the 2008 finals was really just a need for a bathroom break pretty much ruined the most iconic moment of his career. He later backtracked and said that he was joking, but unfortunately the damage to his legacy had already been done. Personally, I remember Paul Pierce as the truth, one of the most lethal scores and dangerous shooters of his day. I remember him as the guy who didn't let 11 stab wounds stop him from playing out the NBA season and tearing up the rest of the league. Based on the perspective of the basketball community, he's extremely underrated. Based on Paul Pierce's view of himself in his own mind, he's extremely overrated. On my channel, I aim for transparency, so I figured I might as well start this video being as real with you guys as possible. One specific tweet triggered the heck out of me and motivated me to make this video. Although it's about one tweet, it's not truly just about one tweet. It's about this general attitude from a large demographic of basketball fans, and I'll explain that further in a bit. But first, let me show you the tweet that I'm talking about. So this is a post of an incredibly famous highlight that I'm sure most of us have seen. It's of Michael Jordan ascending into the air, realizing his shot is about to be blocked, so he then adjusts, hangs in the air, and finally shoots the ball as the defender is descending. It's an incredible highlight that shows Jordan's tremendous leaping ability, it shows his high IQ, it shows his fantastic body control, and it displays the capability of his massive hands. Now is this highlight overrated? Maybe. Is it possible that we spend too much time glazing this play just because it's Michael Jordan who did it? Possibly, but that's besides the point. This absolute Einstein on all things basketball chimed in with his take. He said, snatched by anyone that isn't an autistic janitor. Obviously, as someone who appreciates basketball history and who appreciates the athletes of years past, this comment annoyed me quite a bit. It's not just the comment itself, but it's this general disrespectful attitude that is absolutely hell-bent on diminishing Jordan's competition by all means necessary. Because, let's be honest, he's probably an overly zealous LeBron fan. The thing is, he made one fatal mistake. The kind of mistake that quickly exposes oneself as a casual and shamelessly displays the fact that he doesn't know ball. I get it, he's a basic looking white guy from the 90s. But this guy is not an autistic janitor. This is Brent freaking Barry. He's the son of NBA legend Rick Barry, who happens to be the guy with the highest final scoring average in NBA history. Now as far as Brent Barry, he wasn't some NBA superstar, but he was a freak athlete. In fact, in 1996, he competed in the NBA's dunk contest and he went on to win the competition with this ridiculous free throw line dunk with his warm-up jacket on. Not only was this guy not an unathletic janitor, but he was legitimately a world-class athlete and possibly one of the greatest leapers in NBA history, given the fact that he dunked the ball from the free throw line with his freaking warm-up jacket on. That's the guy that tried to snatch Jordan's shot and MJ had to outhang him in the air in order to score the basket. Now here's my confession. The reason I'm annoyed by players from the past being referred to as plumbers, janitors, and firemen is not because it disrespects Michael Jordan. Michael Jordan doesn't need me to defend him. His legacy is secure. Nearly every time a poll is done on who is the greatest player of all time, Jordan usually takes home 60 to 70% of the votes. So again, I'm not annoyed on behalf of Jordan. I'm annoyed on behalf of this guy the Brent Berries of the world. Because of the tired and petty debate of Jordan versus LeBron, entire generations of players are getting dumped on because of their agenda to elevate the basketball player they have a crush on. Let's be real, most people who make these critiques are not very familiar with the eras they're critiquing. I doubt most of these fans know about remarkable leapers like Kenny Skywalker, Orlando Woolridge, Daryl Griffith, Larry Nance, Gerald Wilkins, Spud Webb, Michael Cooper, Daryl Dawkins, Xavier McDaniel, Roy Hinson, Tom Chambers, and so on. 
It's no wonder why you refer to players in the 80s as plumbers when your knowledge of that era only goes 10 players deep. One of the most frustrating things about these types of criticisms is not just the blatant ignorance, but it's also the perpetuated misinformation and lies. Like for example, players were shorter back in that era. That is just objectively not true. That information is easily accessible online with just a little bit of research. There's also this predominant thought in modern society that the latest and newest thing is always the best. In the case of some things, that is true, but certainly not in everything. For example, Usain Bolt is still the world record holder for the fastest 100 meter dash in Olympic history, which was 9.58 seconds. And he did this in 2009. 14 years have passed with more recent athletes and advancing technology and advanced trading methods. And yet, no one in the world has been able to beat it, despite thousands of athletes attempting to do so. Another simple example of something not becoming better with time is our own United States Fitness. Here is actual footage of high school students around the country in 1962 participating in basic PE classes. Now tell me, those of you who are high school students in 2023, do most of your classmates look like this, or do they more often look like they ate two of these guys and a large fry? Personally, as an American, I would argue that the quality of our food, our physical fitness, and even our sense of discipline have all deteriorated in quality over time. Again, it's a simpleton's view that everything is improving over time. Sure, maybe the modern athletes have made some advancements, but to act like we've gone from incompetent scrubs to infallible superhumans in the span of just three decades is utterly ridiculous. To a lot of you, this makes sense on a surface level, but unfortunately, too many people's emotional investments make them incapable of accepting these basic truths. Again, I have my own opinions when it comes to stuff like the GOAT debate, but personally, I hardly care what your opinion is. If you think Michael Jordan is the greatest player of all time, cool, you're welcome to my channel. If you think LeBron James is the greatest player of all time, cool, you're welcome to my channel. If you think Dylan Brooks is the greatest player of all time, it's a little weird, but cool, you're welcome to my channel. But as a basketball historian, what I can't stand is terrific athletes being constantly disrespected because of this ridiculous debate. When you make these outlandish plumber critiques about players like Brent Berry, all it does is shoot up a red flag to all of us who actually know ball and makes it known that you're extremely ignorant about the game's history. Now before anyone suggests it, in no way is this video meant to slander players from this modern era, who I have a tremendous amount of respect for. For goodness sake, just check yesterday's video on this channel if you need evidence of that. Instead, my aim is to give a greater understanding and appreciation for all the amazing players throughout this game's rich history. Try it, it's freeing. Seriously, be that LeBron fan who thinks that he's the GOAT but can't respect the quality of Jordan's competition. Be that MJ fan who thinks he's the GOAT but doesn't act like every single modern player is a flopping sissy just because it suits your LeBron hating agenda. Or if you're a Steph Curry fan, just hate both equally. Listen, I've been a diehard Lakers fan my entire life and my favorite player will always be Kobe Bryant. And trust me, I wanted to push him into the GOAT conversation, but I gave up on that agenda when he failed to win his sixth ring and tore his Achilles. That was my dog in this fight, but that dog has since come and gone. The reason why I'm so passionate about trying to remove these biases from the debates is because if we do, it allows a space for something incredibly rare, genuine and honest basketball discussions. It's in those rare instances where I've had my most enjoyable basketball conversations, where we're able to share our unique perspectives and insights without the whole thing feeling like a massive pissing contest. I don't know how many of you guys are with me on that, but if you are, just let me know in the comments below. Today, I'm bringing you a story about a player that very few basketball fans know about, and in the time he played the game, he was one of the greatest basketball players to ever live. 
His life would become one of the most tragic tales of basketball history, but also one of the most heartwarming stories about life and friendship that you'll ever hear. Let's get into it. Maurice Stokes was born near Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania in 1933. He was a loved and highly respected individual amongst his friends and peers, and that theme would continue into his NBA career. Maurice had remarkable God-given athleticism at a very young age. He played college ball at St. Francis University and quickly became one of the most highly coveted prospects in the NBA draft. In 1955, at the age of 22, he was taken with the second overall pick by the Rochester Royals. He was a 6'7", 232-pound power forward, who was freakishly quick, athletic, strong, and was remarkably skilled with a basketball, and he was able to put all of those abilities on display as soon as he hit the floor. As a big man, he would regularly grab the rebound and take it coast to coast on his own, which certainly wasn't a common thing in that era. When we envision a modern athlete going in a time machine and playing against the less athletic competition of the 50s, that's what Marie Stokes looked like out there on the court. The competition simply couldn't handle him as he took full advantage of the disparity in the athleticism. Maurice was also a very intelligent basketball player who had incredible court vision. Due to this, he was a remarkable distributor, especially for a big in the 1950s, which was basically unheard of during that era. Honestly, the best comparison I can make to his build and skill set is that Maurice Stokes was the LeBron James of the 1950s. The rookie was taking the league by storm. In his very first NBA game, he dominated the New York Knicks in all aspects, as he dropped 32 points, snagged 20 rebounds, and dished out 8 assists on a deadly 61% shooting. In each of his first four games in the NBA, he secured 20 rebounds. His abilities as a scorer, rebounder, and facilitator made him one of the greatest triple-double threats in league history. At one point, he recorded a triple-double in four consecutive games, which is a feat that only seven other players have accomplished in NBA history. Just one month after his incredible debut game, he had another impressive showing against the title-contending Boston Celtics, where he dropped 31 points, 27 rebounds, and 6 assists, leading his Royals to a one-point victory. Just a month after that, he lit up the defending champion Syracuse Nationals, producing one of the greatest performances by a rookie that sports has ever seen. On the night, he dropped 26 points, 38 rebounds, and 12 assists on 61% shooting. And thanks to this Herculean effort, his Royals upset the defending champion Nationals with a final score of 102-93. At the end of his debut season, he was awarded the league's Rookie of the Year and even got an MVP vote. That debut season, he averaged 16.8 points, 16.3 rebounds, and 4.9 assists as he firmly established himself as one of the best players in the game. He was the league leader in rebounds already in his rookie season. This individual dominance continued into his second and third season in the league. He was selected as an NBA All-Star in all three of those seasons, and he earned an NBA All-Selections all three of those seasons as well. In his third year, he was second overall in rebounds and third overall in assists. The only other player who's ever accomplished that feat was the legendary Wilt Chamberlain. I need to emphasize, he wasn't just a good rebounder, but at the mere height of 6 foot 7 inches tall, he was one of the few greatest rebounders of all time. For his career, he had the third highest rebounding average in NBA history at 17.3 per game, which trails only the great Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell. Thanks to his efforts in his third season, he was making his first trip to the NBA playoffs. Unfortunately, it was the only playoff series that he would ever participate in. On March 12th, in the last regular season game of 1958, on a drive to the basket, Maurice leaped high into the air and went over the back of the opponent and landed directly on his head. For a while, he was unconscious. Eventually, he was able to regain consciousness with smelling salts. Despite the horrific fall, he returned to the game and finished the contest with 24 points and 19 rebounds in a 7-point victory over the Lakers. Three days later was his first NBA playoff game, and little did he know that it was the last game of his NBA career. 
On the night, he scored 12 points and snagged 15 rebounds and a loss to the Detroit Pistons. After the game, the Royals went on their flight back to Cincinnati for game two of the series. During the flight, Maurice suddenly collapsed and began to have a seizure. All of his teammates were obviously extremely concerned. As soon as the flight landed in Cincinnati, an ambulance picked him up and rushed him to the hospital. After being in a coma for about a day, Stokes eventually woke up when he discovered that he was completely paralyzed, only able to use his brain and look around with his eyes. Obviously, this was due to the brain damage caused by his fall several nights earlier. Of course, this completely changed Marie Stokes' life, as he not only lost function of movement, but there was now tremendous medical bills to pay that he couldn't afford. Maurice didn't have much of a support system and didn't have very many loved ones to take care of him. This was something that deeply affected his teammates emotionally. One of those teammates throughout all three of his years in the NBA was the small forward and his dear friend, Jack Twyman, who was the only teammate who lived near Stokes. Jack was only 23 years old at this point and had recently got married and started his own family. After speaking with his wife about the matter, they came to a major decision. Out of love and compassion for his teammate, Jack decided to become a caretaker and the legal guardian of Maurice, accepting all financial responsibility and all responsibilities for his well-being. Jack was now there to support his teammate and his friend, as Stokes fought hard to recover some of his physical abilities. Maurice took that same positive energy and determination that he had on the court and channeled that into his recovery process. Through all of this, their bond and their friendship grew tremendously as the two leaned upon each other for support. Slowly, Maurice started to regain tiny bits of functionality in his body. In June of 1969, over a decade after Maurice's paralyzing fall, Jack Twyman was contacted by St. Francis College, which was Maurice's college university. They told Jack that they had built a new beautiful gymnasium and wanted to honor their former star player by naming the gym the Marie Stokes Fieldhouse. As a surprise for Maurice's birthday, Jack and his family held an event where the president and athletic director of the college announced the name of the gym to Maurice, who was unaware of the decision up until that point. When he was made aware of this, a grateful Stokes wept tremendously. Back then, NBA players didn't make nearly the kind of money that they do today. So even a star player like Jack Twyman needed financial aid to support Maurice. A man by the name of Milton Kutcher was a business owner of a country club in upstate New York and was a massive basketball fan. Milton was aware of the situation between Maurice Stokes and Jack Twyman. Milton Kutcher reached out to Jack Twyman and suggested that the country club hosted a basketball game to raise funds for Maurice's medical bills. Milton said that he would cover all of the expenses for the event. All Jack had to do was recruit the players. The event only needed 10 players for the game to commence, but thanks to Stokes for being such a beloved person within the league, roughly 75 of the NBA's best players showed up to the event at their own expense including guys like Will Chamberlain, Bill Russell, and Dolph Shays. For years, this event continued on annually, with many greats consistently making appearances, like Wilt, Oscar Robertson, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, Willis Reed, and Pete Maravich, just to name a few. After some time, once some of his physical abilities just slightly returned to him, Maurice was even able to attend his own event, and experience once again the love that the league had for him. Eventually, on April 6, 1970, Maurice Stokes passed away from a heart attack at the young age of 36. After his passing, the event continued on in the form of a basketball charity game for many years afterwards, carrying on his legacy and touching the lives of many after him. As you can see throughout this story, not only was Stokes a powerful force within the league with his basketball skills, but he was also a powerful force in the hearts of many as his story is one of perseverance and friendship. In terms of basketball, Jack Twyman is on record saying that if the accident never happened, considering how the Royals acquired Oscar Robertson shortly afterwards, he believes the Royals would have been the dynasty of the 60s rather than the Celtics. That we can never know for sure. But what we do know is that the short time that Stokes was out there on the court, he was one of the best players to ever lace him up. 
The NBA in the 1960s featured some of the most legendary basketball players to ever live. With that being said, some players from that era built up such a legacy for themselves that they've overshadowed some of the other talented greats of that time. Players that still get talked about frequently are legends like Bill Russell, Wilt Chamberlain, Jerry West, Elgin Baylor, Oscar Robertson, John Havlicek, and Bob Pettit. But some aren't quite as popular, as their greatness has become overlooked as time has gone on. Today, we're evaluating those overlooked legends of the 60s as we analyze what made them special and learn more about an era frequently taken for granted. First off, Walt Bellamy. He was a strong 6'11 center who played for numerous franchises throughout his career. He was incredibly athletic, very quick, and a quality mid-range shooter, especially for a big man. As an elite scorer and rebounder, he broke out into the league as an immediate superstar. Just how good was he as a rookie? Well, let me put it this way. If it wasn't for Wilt Chamberlain, you could make a legitimate argument that Walt Bellamy had the greatest rookie season in NBA history. In his debut season with the Chicago Packers, he averaged 31.6 points, 19 rebounds, and 2.7 assists on a league-leading 51.9% from the field. When people say that Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell didn't have much competition at the position, remember that not only did they have to play each other, but they had to match up against Walt Bellamy 10 times a season, not even including the playoffs. He never broke through and won an NBA championship, but he was the 1962 Rookie of the Year, made four All-Star teams, and is an NBA Hall of Famer. Second is Nate Thurmond. This man is one of the most underrated big men of league history, as the 6'11 center was drafted in the 1963 draft by the San Francisco Warriors. He was built like a tank, which helped him dominate the boards. During a four-season stretch, he averaged over 20 rebounds per game, yet didn't win any rebounding titles due to Chamberlain and Russell hogging all of them. He was a consistent 2020 player while also locking down big men defensively as he made a total of five all-defense teams during his career. He was an all-around force on the court, and nothing may better prove that than this next point. In the history of the NBA, only a total of four players have achieved the rare quadruple-double, and Nate Thurmond is one of them. He did it in 1974 as a member of the Chicago Bulls, when he dropped 22 points, 14 rebounds, 13 assists, and 12 blocks on 67% shooting. The thing is, blocks and steals were not a recorded stat until the 1973-74 season, which means that Thurman spent the first 10 seasons of his career without his blocks and steals being tracked. By the time he officially achieved the quadruple-double, it was well after his prime years so it's quite likely that this was a feat that Thurman did several times. Not only is he underrated, but he's consistently disrespected, being frequently referred to as a plumber that Will Chamberlain and Bill Russell took advantage of. I'm not sure how many of you young viewers have had a plumber show up to your home, but I have, and they're not 6'11", and they don't look like this. Next is Jack Twyman. Jack was a 6'6 small forward who began his career in 1955 as a member of the Royals, and he remained with the Royals until his retirement in 1966. Twyman was an incredibly efficient scorer as he led the league in field goal percentage in 1958, which is a feat that's normally achieved by centers. He was an elite perimeter shooter who probably could have benefited from a three-point line. Even without the line, his scoring reached as high as 31.2 in 1960. Although he is in the Hall of Fame, his legacy goes under the radar mostly due to the fact that he's almost always played with a below average supporting cast, and didn't do much winning as a result. Fourth up is Jerry Lucas. The 6'8 power forward was one of the greatest rebounding forwards of league history, as he averaged over 19 boards per game over the course of his first six seasons in the league. He was also incredibly efficient, shooting 49.9% from the field over the course of his career, which is way more efficient than it sounds, considering the fact that he did it in the 1960s when shooting percentages were generally much lower league-wide. Lucas is a Hall of Famer, a 7-time All-Star, a 5-time All-NBA player, a Rookie of the Year winner, and he won the NBA championship as a role player with the historically great 1973 New York Knicks. Next is Hal Greer. Greer is one of Wilt Chamberlain's greatest teammates that you rarely hear about. The 6'2 shooting guard was a great ball handler and had one of the purest and fundamentally sound jump shots of the 1960s. He loved to play in transition and was a solid finisher around the rim as well. 
He was a 10-time All-Star, made seven All-NBA teams, and he was the second best player on the 1967 Philadelphia 76ers, who won 68 games in the regular season and went on to win the NBA championship. In those finals, it wasn't Chamberlain who was the leading scorer, but it was actually Hal Greer, who put up 26 points, 8 rebounds, and 6.2 assists in a six-game series. Although most basketball fans, including myself, believe that Bill Russell had more help than Wilt Chamberlain, it would be extremely disrespectful to Hal Greer to suggest that Chamberlain didn't have a significant amount of help. Next up is Lenny Wilkins. Wilkins is probably most commonly known for his great coaching career, but he was a fantastic player as well. The 6'1 point guard was known for being an artist with the basketball as he had a unique ability to finish around the basket, and he was one of the best distributors in the league as he was consistently among the game's league leaders in assists per game. He got as high as 22.4 points per game and 9.6 assists per game. He never won the NBA championship, but he did help his St. Louis Hawks reach the NBA Finals in 1961, where they were defeated by Bill Russell's Celtics. In total, he made nine All-Star teams and is a member of the Basketball Hall of Fame. Lastly is Sam Jones, Bailey Howell, and Tommy Heinsohn. These three are underrated Celtics legends, and the great Bill Russell wouldn't be anywhere close to his 11 rings if it wasn't for them. Although he was a legend with a goat-worthy resume, Russell was rarely the best offensive player on his own team, and he had the luxury of focusing his game on his defense and rebounding, while guys like Sam Jones, Tom Heinsohn, and Bailey Howell did the heavy lifting offensively. Sam Jones was a 6'4 shooting guard who won 10 championships as a member of the Boston Celtics. He could get hot quickly, and he loved his baseline jumpers. He led his Celtics in scoring in five separate seasons, and they won the championship in four of those seasons, including the 1965 season, where he averaged 25.9 points on 45.2% shooting. Tommy Heinsohn and Bailey Howell were both power forwards, who were similar in their skill set and production. Heinsohn held down the position for the Celtics from 1956 to 1964, and he poured in 19.2 points over that stretch. Bailey took over where he left off, and held down the power forward spot from 1966 to 1970, putting in 18 points and 8.4 rebounds on 48% shooting over that stretch. When you consider all of the tremendous weapons the Celtics had throughout that decade, it comes as no surprise that they were able to win so many championships. So over the years on my channel, I've changed my mind several times on who I believe was the most underrated player in NBA history. And honestly, I think I have a legitimate reason to change it once again. Now when I say quote underrated, I mean it in a literal sense. I'm not talking about guys who are underappreciated or underrecognized, but I'm talking about a guy who is ranked way lower by the general audience than I believe he should be. The player I'm talking about is the 7 foot 1 inch center David Robinson, also known as the Admiral. This legend had a late start to his NBA career, due to him finishing his time in the Navy. He didn't end up playing his first game in the NBA until he was at the age of 24. Now we all agree that he was a good player and a perennial all-star, but when I last ranked my 30 greatest players of all time, I had Robinson at 22 which was ahead of guys like Karl Malone, Kevin Garnett, Giannis, and Nikola Jokic. I think this specific ranking created more backlash than any other ranking on the list. People simply don't believe that Robinson is as good as I think he was. I believe there's several reasons for this. For one, Robinson is generally seen by modern fans as a playoff choker. He was famously bested by Hakeem Olajuwon in the 1995 Western Conference Finals, and that lasting impression has done a lot to hinder his legacy. The other thing is that David Robinson was never the best player on either of his championship teams. Sure, he won it in 1999 and 2003, but those were mostly as complementary roles to the Finals MVP, Tim Duncan. Lastly, a lot of younger fans believe that when Tim Duncan was drafted in 1997, he saved the Admiral and the Spurs from the bottom feeding ranks of the league, which honestly couldn't be further from the truth. Let's actually start with this narrative. When Duncan was drafted by San Antonio, the Spurs had the first overall pick, since they had just finished the previous season with an ugly 20-62 record. 
So immediately, at face value, it seems that Duncan saved an embarrassing franchise. But that's completely lacking context. In the 1996 preseason, Robinson severely hurt his back, and due to this, he missed his first 18 games of the regular season, before eventually returning to action on December 10th, 1997. Then Robinson only played six regular season games before he broke his foot, resulting in a season being shut down early. What you need to understand is that Robinson's absence was the reason the Spurs finished with only a 20-62 record. For goodness sake, they had just won 59 games in the previous season with a healthy Robinson, and many San Antonio fans had championship hopes for the 96-97 season, before it all went crashing down with the Admiral's injuries. Before Duncan showed up, there was basically never a time where Robinson's Spurs weren't seen as legitimate contenders in the Western Conference, as the Robinson-led Spurs were averaging a whopping 55 wins a season over their seven-year stretch before the injuries. This wasn't some super team either, as the Spurs' next best player was the small forward Sean Elliott, who was a quality player, but I would also describe him as a borderline all-star at best. The truth is, Duncan wasn't just joining some rebuilding lottery team, but he was joining a perennial Western Conference contender, thanks first and foremost to the dominant play of David Robinson. Obviously, David wasn't totally the same player when he returned from the injury, since he was now in his mid-30s while recovering from an injury that often destroys the careers of many big men. Regardless, in his first season back in 1998, he averaged nearly 22 points, 11 rebounds, and 2.6 blocks, while hitting 51% of his shots. He actually finished 7th overall in the MVP race, and 3rd overall in the Defensive Player of the Year voting. Again, that was his impact in his declining phase. And his prime was something else entirely. At different points in his career, Robinson led the NBA in scoring, in rebounding, and he led the NBA in blocked shots. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is the only other player in NBA history who has led the league in points per game, rebounds per game, and blocks per game. Technically, Wilt Chamberlain should probably be in that list as well, if blocked shots had been tracked in his era. But still, the fact that Robinson did something that only Kareem and Wilt have ever done should really tell you just how special he was. Robinson's defense is criminally slept on, as he was simply one of the greatest rim protectors of all time. He made eight all-defense teams in his career, which is the third most among primary centers. Also consider the fact that he earned eight selections while competing against the likes of Akeem Olajuwon, Patrick Ewing, Shaquille O'Neal, Dikembe Mutombo, and Alonzo Mourning. He was the NBA's Defensive Player of the Year in 1992, and he averaged an absurd 2.3 steals, which was the fifth most in the entire league, and a whopping 4.5 blocks, which was the seventh highest single season average of all time. Add in his 1995 MVP and his two championship rings, and yeah, this guy has a pretty insane resume that isn't usually ranked high enough. He wasn't just some big towering player who took advantage of players smaller than him, but Robinson was an athletic freak who was way ahead of his time. He was one of the strongest, if not the strongest player in the entire league. He was fast, he was quick, he was lethal in transition, and he had an incredibly soft touch on his jump shot that was very dangerous as far as 18 feet out. Now, was he the greatest playoff performer? No, but a lot of guys are ranked high on the all-time list while having plenty of postseason struggles. I'm not saying that Robinson should be ahead of centers like Shaquille O'Neal or Hakeem Olajuwon, but to act like it's utterly ludicrous to have him in the top 25 is simply a misunderstanding of his tremendous impact, both statistically and in terms of winning games. So here's the deal. My channel focuses primarily on basketball history. Although I occasionally discuss topics related to the modern game, my brand focuses on generations past. Because of this, most of my viewing audience tends to be boomers and Gen Xers. 
I imagine many of you guys aren't aware of this ongoing narrative on TikTok and Twitter, and sometimes even here on YouTube. Every day, more and more people are beginning to claim that Wilt Chamberlain's 100-point game never happened. As for myself personally, I do believe that this game happened, and I'll explain why in this video. But at the very least, I can understand why there's some recent skepticism from some modern NBA fans. For one, a 100-point game is so far from anything we've ever seen. We saw Kobe give one of the greatest performances of all time when he dropped 81 points in 2006. And even then, he was still a whopping 10 baskets short of eclipsing Wilt's total. The other reason for the skepticism is the fact that none of Wilt's 100-point game was caught on film. We have a box score and some personal testimonies of what his teammates and opponents witnessed, but not a single highlight. This has led some people to believe that the whole thing is simply a made-up fairy tale. Now I'm all for a good conspiracy because newsflash, people lie. And I think it's always good to use critical thinking when you're told to believe something. As for myself personally, I'm obviously not old enough to have lived through that time. Since I was not there on that day, I cannot say beyond a shadow of a doubt that this game actually happened. But I can at least explain why I believe it did. Here are my five reasons why I believe Wilt scored 100 points. Point number one, 100 points isn't actually as crazy as it sounds. The season that Wilt allegedly scored 100 points, teams were averaging 118.8 points per game. That is literally the highest scoring season of NBA history. Not only did Will average 50 points that season, but Oscar Robertson averaged a 30-point triple-double, and the Lakers' Elgin Baylor averaged 38.3 points per game, which is the highest scoring average by anyone other than Wilt. Simply put, offense was absurdly inflated in 1962, and that's because the pace of play was at a blistering speed. Even without three-point shots, teams were able to produce so much offense, simply because of the sheer amount of possessions that they had. Here's something else to consider. Wilt Chamberlain wasn't scoring that many points in 1962 simply because he was better than everyone else, but it was also because he was playing so much more than everyone else. You see, heading into the 1961-1962 season, Frank McGuire had just been hired to be the head coach of the Philadelphia Warriors. According to McGuire, he had a private meeting with Wilt before the season began, and in that meeting, he asked Wilt how many minutes he would like to play per game. And to that, Wilt responded by saying, I never want to go to the bench. As surreal as it sounds by modern day standards, Frank honored that request from Wilt. Other than a game where Chamberlain had been ejected, he played every single minute of every single game in the 1961-62 regular season. Wilt averaged 50.4 points in 1962, but his per 36 minute stats reduced that scoring average to a more comprehensible 37.4. Michael Jordan famously averaged 37.1 points per game in 1987, but the thing is, he only averaged 40 minutes per game, and if you prorate his minutes to 48 per game, then MJ's scoring average increases to 44.5 per game. So just by looking at the minutes and at these stats, you can start to see how Wilt's scoring isn't quite as insane as it sounds on the surface level. Another thing to consider is that Wilt Chamberlain was absurdly hot heading into the 100-point game. It was actually his fourth straight game where he had scored at least 60 points. And in a game just several months earlier, he had scored 78 points. At the time, many writers were starting to speculate that he might eventually score 100 points. So although it was amazing, it wasn't really the most surprising thing to happen in basketball. Now here's the other thing. Will allegedly scored 100 points against the New York Knicks on March 2nd, 1962 in Hershey, Pennsylvania. The Knicks were one of the worst teams in the league defensively, as they were allowing roughly 120 points per game. 
But as bad as the Knicks were on defense, they were even worse the night that Wilt was going up against them. You see, the Knicks' usual starting center that season was a 6'10 player in his sixth year, named Phil Jordan. According to reports, Phil had been out partying the night before and was vomiting prior to tip-off. Because of this, Phil sat out of that game. This means that Wilt was going up against the Knicks' backup center, Daryl Imhoff. Daryl was 6'10", but he was also a skinny second-year player who wasn't accustomed to defending starting centers, let alone Wilt Chamberlain. Seeing how Wilt always played 48 minutes, he was gonna be guarded by the backup of the backup. When Daryl Emhoff went to the bench, the player who then had to defend Wilt was a 6'9 rookie forward, Cleveland Buckner. So again, when you consider that the Knicks sucked defensively, the starting center was out, and Wilt was spending a large portion of the game up against an undersized rookie who was out of position, then yeah, it's not really surprising that this happened to be the night that he allegedly scored 100 points. Some will say that the craziest and most suspicious part is that he went 28 of 32 from the free throw line. At first glance, yeah, that looks really odd, coming from a player who's a career 51% foul shooter. But here's the thing, Bad free throw shooters getting in a good rhythm is not something completely unheard of. Shaq was also one of the worst free throw shooters in NBA history, and in three games of his career, Shaq made at least 12 free throws without missing any. Giannis isn't a tremendous free throw shooter either, yet he's gone 17 of 17 from the line twice in his career. It's also worth mentioning that Wilt was an extremely streaky and inconsistent free throw shooter. Sometimes he would be solid, and sometimes he would be terrible. One season of his career, he shot 38% from the free throw line, and on another, he shot 61%. His inconsistencies were so confusing that he eventually started visiting a therapist to help him with his foul shooting. Knowing this history about Wilt, and knowing that other terrible foul shooters have had amazing nights from the line, it isn't all that shocking that he went 28 of 32 on the best night of his career. So again, this all isn't as crazy as it sounds. So let's press on. Point number two. The game not being filmed was actually quite normal. To put it simply, the NBA was not very popular in the 1960s, Sure, some games were on television, but those were usually NBA playoff games with a tape delay. This game, on the other hand, was just a monotonous regular season matchup involving one decent and one terrible team. Back then, technology was nowhere close to what it is today. Nobody had smartphones, and very few people even had cameras. For the people who had cameras, they weren't usually some small and compact packages back then, but they were actually quite large and expensive, especially when they were filming video. Ask yourself this, how many full-length Wilt Chamberlain games can you find on YouTube that are older than 1967? If you can find any, I'm willing to bet that 99% of them were playoff games. For goodness sake, we don't even have all of Michael Jordan's games on film from his rookie season. Try to find his first regular season game against the Portland Trailblazers. You can't. I know this because I recently made a video about it. And Jordan was a rookie two decades after the 100 game took place. Acting like it's some sort of conspiracy that we don't have the footage of a routine regular season game in 1962 is just silly. Point number three, the era of America they played in. Players like Bill Russell and Wilt Chamberlain have spoken at length about their experiences as a black player in the NBA in the 1960s. If someone made up a 100 point performance, why would they do that? You're telling me that a league that was owned by white men with white viewers of the game in the 1960s lied on behalf of a black man? Yeah, I don't see how that makes any sense. Something else to consider is how the NBA would want this game to be on film. What benefit does the league have by not having footage of the greatest scoring performance in its history? Why would they make that up? 
If anything, they might stage the performance with a scripted outcome. That way, they have it on film to draw interest to the sport. But the fact that they don't have any footage at all probably drives the league office crazy. And I'm sure they wish Kobe's 81 was actually the top scoring performance. That way, they can monetize it and promote it as such. Point number four, the credibility of the eyewitness. According to reports, roughly 4,000 people were in the arena when Wilt Chamberlain scored 100 points. But what almost no one ever mentions is the official statistician. This is Harvey Pollock, and he is in the Hall of Fame. Harvey passed in 2015, but before that, he worked as an official NBA statistician for over 60 years. At the time the game took place, Harvey was in the building as the game statistician. He was a writer for the Philadelphia Inquirer and for the Associated Press. He is the one who tracked Wilt's stats, and he's also the one who handed Wilt a piece of paper with 100 written on it. And he's the man behind the camera who snapped the most iconic photo in basketball history. If there is anyone with the credibility to provide a trustworthy box score, it's Harvey Pollock. Point number five, the radio broadcast. A lot of people who claim this never happened because it wasn't on film usually don't know that we actually have the fourth quarter's audio of the radio broadcast. You can listen to snippets of this audio on YouTube where the game is described in detail. Here's an audio clip of the moment Wilt scored 100. 167 to 146. Now let's see if they found somebody quick. Rogers throws long to Chamberlain. He's got it. He's trying to get up. He shoots. No good. The rebound, Luckinville. Back to Chamberlain. He shoots up. No good. In and out. The rebound, Luckinville. Back to Ruckwick. Into Chamberlain. This radio broadcast is actually being preserved in the Library of Congress. So again, if this was all a lie, Harvey Pollock was in on it, the thousands of people who were at the game were in on it, the league was in on it, the government is in on it, and they staged a fake radio broadcast just to convince everyone of the lie. Because reasons, I guess. Friends, just admit it. It would make more sense that this game actually happened than it does about it being this big complex lie that involves thousands of separate individuals who are all complicit. So what do you guys think? Are you still skeptical? I look forward to hearing your thoughts in the comment section below. Thanks for watching as always. Make sure to like and subscribe for more basketball content and I'll see you guys in the next video.